Hello everyone, welcome to Eclectic Spacewalk Conversations. I'm your host, Nicholas McKay, and today my guest is Eric Schwitzgable, professor of philosophy at the University of California, Riverside, and the author of A Theory of Jerks and Other Philosophical Misadventures. Welcome to Conversations, Eric. Hey, thanks for having me. So let's jump in first to your uh, personal journey. Where, where were you originally born? I was born originally in Boston, Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, lived in Waltham nearby until I was age seven. Okay. And then we moved out to Thousand Oaks, California, out to uh, suburb of LA. And how was that transition for you at an early age? Northeast to Southern California, I bet yeah, that's... Yeah, I remember waiting in the school bus, uh, for the, in the snow for the school bus. And uh, I remember some of my old friends from there. And I remember the, the nuns at the Catholic elementary school I went to. Okay. That's kind of about it. <laughs> That's about <laughs> it. But then, so you came out here to Thousand Oaks. And then yeah. uh, who, were, who were kind of, when you were young, what did, what did you want to be when you grew up? Um, I wanted to be a writer of some sort. Okay. Yeah, I remember when I was, uh, I have this vivid memory in, in middle school of sitting in the garage with an old manual typewriter, one of these old Royal oh, sure. typewriters. Yeah. The hot garage during the summer, <laughs> no air conditioning, and typing plays. Wow. I would, I would just write plays. Sometimes they'd be dozens or even, I think one was over 100 pages. Wow. I never revised them. Comedies, tragedies, mix? I usually liked uh, either comedies or kind of adventures where you'd have a bunch of people stranded on an island and one by one they'd die in interesting ways. <laughs> okay, okay. So, I mean, but, but you always knew that you had, you, you wanted to be some type of writer. Like, right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, who were your biggest kind of influences? Was it authors uh, at that time or was it maybe family, friends that kind of put you in that direction or? Well, um, my father is a psychology mm -hmm. professor at California Lutheran University. I saw what he did. I thought, that's pretty cool. Right. My mom was a science teacher at uh, Oxnard Community College. So that's also similar in academia. Sure. And I loved reading science fiction. I loved, when I was a teenager, I loved the poetry of T.S. Eliot and Sylvia Plath. Oh, okay. Yeah, I liked definitely. the science writing of Stephen Jay Gould and Lauren Isley. And yeah. So okay. Do so you like of, Arthur C. Clarke and that? But you. I like science fiction. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. We'll get into that in a in a little bit. Um, so out of those childhood influences, um, you you said uh, poet, po poetry. Like that's interesting. Yeah. That like such an early age, but then with the writing dynamic, I think that is very similar. Yeah, so what, right. what, how how has poetry kind of influenced you when you're growing up? Oh, I wrote a lot of poetry. Yeah, 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 yeah. you just write a lot. Yeah. I wrote a lot of poetry. Like, Let's do this as well. I'm going to contribute. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'm a, almost everybody who loves reading poetry, right? Well, so sure. Even if they don't share yeah. it with yeah. anybody. Uh. Yeah. So, in, in those kind of things, so out of the, you said even a hundred pages at, at once, were, do you still have it, uh, those yeah, old writings? I, I was like so a, curious yeah. to see what was in them. Yeah. You know, I have no None, none. Okay. So then, um, so let's talk briefly uh, about your, your dad. Your dad was um, kind of famous in that he was just involved in a, a famous uh, study is that, and you can tell more about this, but um, he was a graduate student under Timothy Leary in the famous yeah. LSD studies, correct? Yeah, that's so right. So how, how, how did that all happen? Was he just there and wanted, you know, it just happened that it was a good, right place, right time kind of thing? I think so, yeah. He... Um had gone to Harvard in the education program there mm -hmm. uh, because he had thought he wanted to be a high school principal. And he soon discovered that he had no interest in being a high school oh, principal. Wow. <laughs> Actually, no. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> do with but, kids. <laughs> but the scene at Harvard at the time, he was very influenced by uh, B.F. Skinner was there, Timothy oh, okay. Leary was there. Sure, sure. Uh, and there was a group of people around them. Uh, and Richard Alpert was briefly there, mm -hmm. briefly there, later changed his name to Ram Dass. Oh, of course, of course. Right? Yes, yes. And so there was a kind of group of people, um, there were meetings by the Harvard humanists, mm -hmm. which kind of s revolved around some of those people. Mm -hmm. um, and he got swept up into that. Right, right, right. Um, was it a good experience? I mean, from, from, from your point of view of his, like, how, was it a good experience for him? Did it learn it a lot? It was. I remember when he was near the end of his life, when he was in his late 70s, mm -hmm. I, we, I recorded various conversations with him, and I asked him something like, "What did, did you have any dreams last night? I don't know why oh, I asked okay, this. Okay. And he said, oh yeah, I, I dreamed about walking across campus at Harvard. And I'm like, 
So this is, he left in 1975, and this interview is, with him was in like 2013. Or oh, okay, so I'm, lots you of You still dream space. about yes. Harvard? And he's like, yes, I still constantly dream about that. It was, he left Harvard and went to California Lutheran University and it was partly because he didn't have a permanent position at Harvard. Oh, he sure, was sure. A, he was a, kind of supported by grant money and mm -hmm. he wanted a tenure track position. Sure. Um, but the kind of fertility, the intellectual fertility of that environment, the social excitement of that environment, he was never really able to, to recreate that in California. Sure. So I mean, that's, that's a tip of the eye. I mean, that's the type, tippy top, if you will. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was kind of like, I think, you know, the peak experience in his yeah. lifetime was being there. He did all kinds of things. Another thing he did uh, when he was at Harvard was he invented the um, electronic monitoring location system for, uh, as an alternative to incarceration. Right, so oh. people wear these ankle monitors yeah, sometimes yeah, sure, instead sure. of going to prison. He invented that. What? Yeah, he invented okay, that okay. as a way of trying to keep uh, youth out of prison. He was... He did a lot of his research on uh, juvenile delinquents, as they mm -hmm. were called at the mm -hmm. time. Sure, back in the, way back in the day, I remember that <laughs> he hung term. out on street corners, <laughs> went to pool halls. Yeah, things right, like that, that nature. Met these people, and um, he thought that there's a lot of them are basically good people who kind of were going down the wrong path, but if they ended up in prison, he thought then that was often ended up putting them further down the wrong oh, sure. path and ruining their lives. So sure. he, he really wanted to create a way to kind of like, just keep them out of trouble, right? Right, right, right? Keep them out of prison, right? And he saw this uh, location monitoring as an alternative to prison for them. So and that was that. way back in, I mean, that must have been what, in the 70s? The 60s. The 60s, in the 60s even. Yeah. So that must have been like pioneering technology at the time. Oh yeah, it yeah. sure was, yeah. Wow, yeah. wow. The interesting uh, use case though, and I guess we'll get into behaviorism and some incentives, because then again, like, in terms of incarceration, like a lot of it nowadays, like the recidivism rate, like does it work, et cetera. Yeah. And then now it's like people are at least asking those questions. What are right. some alternatives? Yeah, yeah. So his, um, some of his dissertation work and his, I think was his first book was called Street Corner Research. Okay. And it was about recidivism. Okay. And it was about these, these, uh, these juvenile delinquents. Um, and what he found was uh, he did this method where he invited them to come talk into a tape recorder. Mm -hmm. So we had these reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. Oh, right? okay, so, okay, reel-to-reel, -reel. yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. Right, and he'd set a <laughs> microphone in the room, and he'd pay them, like, $5? Yeah, sure. Which, you know, is not trivial in the 60s, uh, to come in and just talk for an hour into the microphone. Oh, wow. And record whatever was on their mind, and in some versions, there was a person there who basically didn't respond, right? Just said, oh, interesting, continue, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And in some versions, they were in the room by themselves with a one-way window and oh, they just I observed, see. Yeah. right? And yeah. there'd be no interaction at all. And he found that recidivism rates went way down. Is that like, did, what was the attribution? Because right now, I automatically think that that seems akin to talk therapy. Like, so, you know what I mean? Just like, like talk, yeah. talk therapy, but there's no therapy. Yeah, exactly. You're just talking out loud, <laughs> like, you know. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> you know, I think he thought that having a therapist there as an authority figure already creates mm. a kind of dynamic that they, that th that particular population wouldn't Good like. Good point. Good right? point. Yeah. So he had various theories about why this might have worked, and he wasn't committed to a single particular theory, but, but I think in his heart, what he thought, and kind of what I would like to conclude also, is that the invitation to just reflect in this open-ended way mm -hmm. without a judgmental authority mm. that you're reacting against, right, gets people thinking about, well, what do they really want from life? Mm. What do they really value? What's important to them? Right, it gets them thinking long-term, it gets mm -hmm. them thinking about their values, it gets them thinking in those kinds of ways that maybe help undercut some of the, yeah. you know, impulses and short-term thinking that lead to, um, getting in trouble. Sure. I mean, do you think, uh, like, it seems like that, it, it's almost like nuance is what you're kind of describing in some ways. And like today's time, like, I would, it's almost like to, 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 to be able to have a viewpoint or even just to have it in your mind and mull it over seems so much more taboo nowadays than it is maybe in, what was it, Aristotle's day? He <laughs> had a famous quote about like, you know, it takes a real wise man to then take a thought that he doesn't believe in and like really work around it and stuff like that. Yeah. I don't know if that's something similar, but it just seems like in today's day and age, like, you know, counter views that are not dogmatic are like so shunned, you know, and so put off. 
there may be. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. I mean, it certainly seems like it from social media. There's okay, more well, then, yeah, maybe to, in like, those you know, industries. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, to be kind of more... I, but I don't know if it's empirically the case. Yeah, that's, that's good, good, point, like good point, good point, good um, point. So, um, so then moving on uh, yeah. from, from your dad's kind of point, that, which is very cool. I mean, the fact that your dad was kind of in the Timothy Leary circle, if you will, that's, that's very interesting. Um, and we'll get into, I guess, psychedelics and consciousness a little bit later. But uh, how uh, eventually did you get to, oh, here to Riverside? So then you went to UC right. Berkeley, did your grad stuff, and then right. how did you get here? Well, this is my first job right out yeah, of right. grad school, so. <laughs> okay, so you just stayed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. So I got my bachelor's degree at Stanford in philosophy after having been through a whole bunch of different majors. When I was an undergrad, I just took whatever classes looked interesting. Oh. I would go to eight classes at the beginning of every term. And then see what, see what makes it cut. And then reduce it to three or four that I thought were the most interesting. Yeah, sure. And I paid no attention to requirements. Right. And just took whatever I wanted. Yeah. And figured whatever... I end up taking the most of, that must be what I like best. Mm -hmm. So then I'll become a professor of that. That. <laughs> <laughs> so then I discovered that it was philosophy. Sure. And then I went to uh, philosophy at Berkeley, got my PhD studying with um, Alison Gopnik in developmental psychology, mm -hmm. Lisa Lloyd in philosophy of science, and John Searle, the philosopher of mind. Mm -hmm. uh, got my degree, and UC Riverside offered me a job. And, you know, for... PhDs in philosophy. Yeah. There are not many jobs <laughs> in the world. I think there were 44 jobs in the entire English wow. speaking world that I could apply for. Wow. And uh, so to g even get one. You're is, stoked. <laughs> I was totally stoked. So I came down here and it's been a great place to be a professor. That's interesting. So it's ever since Boston, then coming to Thousand Oaks, like a little bit outside of LA, then you go up to Berkeley, the Bay Area, and then now yeah. you come come back down here to Riverside. It's yeah, yeah. moving around a lot, but California has been here. I've been in here. California <laughs> from age seven to age 51 wow, so far. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to your um, your uh, postgraduate days. So you're at Berkeley with John Searle, who um, I read his book Mind, L Language, and Body recently, which was very interesting. Um, but let's talk about, he had a famous thought experiment for a lot of people who are kind of the layman is the Chinese room. Um, and let's just, I guess you can maybe set it up and we can talk more about it. But basically it was a thought experiment that talked about how computers, um, in today's day and age, people were thinking that it's, uh, we're on the, on the developmental stage of a intelligent AI right. and, and stuff. And so like, let's just, I guess, maybe you can <laughs> describe the, right. the thought experiment. So Cyril is very skeptical. He's one of the most famous skeptics about um, AI having consciousness, AI having real understanding of language. Mm -hmm. um, so, and yeah, his most famous argument for this is what's sometimes called, well, he, what he called the Chinese room. Yeah. Right. So the idea is John Searle himself is sitting in this room. Yep. And in one side of the room, uh, Chinese characters come in. Mm -hmm. Right. And he knows nothing of Chinese. Yeah. He typical says, Western. He looks at these queries. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> I mean, I know a little Chinese. Uh, yeah, yeah. I barely. <laughs> <laughs> so he looks at these characters. To him, they basically mean squiggle squaggle. Yep. Right. And then he's got this long, complicated book. And I think this is a little bit of a weakness in the experiment that he doesn't really. Okay. Fair. Thoroughly conceptualize what this book would have to involve, right? But the way he lays it out, he's got this big book that he can look in that says, okay, if I get Squiggle Squaggle as this input, these, these characters that look like this, then he looks it up in some tra tables in the book, and then he puts some other characters out the other side. Mm -hmm. And, and out, if the rule book is good enough, uh, then it could implement any computer program. Right. right, because computer programs ultimately come down to if-then statements. Yep. If you get this input and you're in this state, then do that. Mm -hmm. Right. So this can all be included in a rule book. So you could implement basically any program in a large enough rule book. So from the outside, it could look like it's Chinese going on. Yeah. Right. So John Searle knows Chinese. Yeah. Or, or, yeah, or, right. or, yeah, yeah, he knows Chinese. <laughs> yeah. Right, so and Cyril says, well, look, I don't know Chinese, Yeah. right? It's absurd to think that this system consisting of the room, the rule book, and me, and the Chinese figures knows Chinese. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing here that knows Chinese. And yet from the outside, it could look exactly like totally. a system that knows Chinese, mm -hmm. right? And this is a critique specifically of, most specifically of the Turing test. Mm-hmm. 
So and the Turing test basically says, well, if you create a computer and you can have a conversation with it that is indistinguishable from a conversation you have with a normal person, then say that the computer is thinking. Right. right? That's all it really takes. Mm -hmm. Right. So Searle says, well, look, you know, this system could pass the Turing test, but there would be no knowledge of Chinese going on. Right. So therefore, the Turing test is not a test of real language understanding. It's not a test of real conscious knowledge of Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, and he thinks basically all computer programs are like that. They're just kind of rules that get implemented by a machine, but there's no consciousness right. really going on. And, so I, and I think one of the things that, so I want your take on this, is like the difference between almost like machine learning and deep learning. Because machine mm -hmm. learning, it's, it's like, you know, you put in certain inputs and then it learns, at, or sorry, you put in certain inputs and then it, you know, does the if-then statements. But mm -hmm. then deep learning is almost how we as children learn. We mm -hmm. take in all the, con the context and different things. But then you could even say that at the end of that, that humans are programming whatever and pro plugging in their biases but one thing I wanted to talk to you about is um so going off of that from that basically AI uh, becoming like sentient or intelligent through through those processes um, humans are fundamentally thought of as quote more than processes of information what he is saying that like computers are like um, that my experience of the color red is different than your experience of the color red, et cetera, in terms of consciousness. So I, I just want to kind of piggyback off that and like what exactly is consciousness, you know? And I know that that's a big, yeah. big laudable thing, but like where do we start? You know, I, right. it's a very like re, we can either be reductionist in the terms of like taking it as a biological process that all of a sudden we, it emerges that you and I are conscious or it can come, it's, people have said like panpsychism is that like, you know, we are kind of tuned in to consciousness coming to us and that can be our soul. So wh like where do you start even in the, in the thought experiment of the Chinese room, where, where's the beginning or where's the a priori or where's, where's the start of kind of this conversation? Well, I think it helps to have a good definition of consciousness. That's a good place to start. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, and I think it's actually really hard to come up with a good definition of consciousness, and I think there are for principal sure. reasons for this. Sure. So, you know, when we think about defining things, we often think about definition in terms of an analytic function, an analytic decomposition of its components. Right. right? So if you think about how, what's a rectangle? Right. Well, a rectangle is a planar closed figure that's got four sides and right angles. Right, right. Right. And that kind of breaks it down into some components, right? And that's a nice definition of a rectangle. <laughs> and then anytime you see a rectangle, then you should be, or you should be able to define that as such. Right. right. Yeah. So, but you, you, you probably can't define consciousness kind of in terms of an analytic decomposition in that way, because consciousness, at least some people think, it's kind of a fundamentally simple phenomenon that's mm -hmm. not decomposable into these other phenomena. Mm -hmm. um, you also can't define it functionally. Like you could, you say a heart. Well, that's just an organ that functions to pump the blood, mm -hmm. right? It's not clear what the function of conscious, consciousness would be. You can't really define it by synonymy because it raises the same questions. People will say, well, consciousness, I mean like the stream of experience, mm. or I mean that there's something that's like to be you, right? So you could, or I mean phenomenology, right? There are all these mm -hmm. terms mm -hmm. that people use that are more or less interchangeable, but you're kind of just swapping out interchangeable right. terms that all have the same kind of unclarity in them. So what is the zest then of consciousness? What is the <laughs> essence? Yeah, what is so the I think <laughs> the, I think the only way to define it is a way that seems kind of dis unrespect uh, 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 disrespectable, mm. which is, but I think is a, is a way that we often define things, and that's defining it by example. Mm. And I think if you look at the best relatively neutral definitions of consciousness in the philosophical literature, they are all at root definitions by example. Mm -hmm. So the way that people like Searle or Ned Block or I define consciousness is by pointing to examples of it and saying, well, it's stuff like that, mm -hmm. right? So if you close your eyes and you form a visual image of your house or your apartment, mm -hmm. right, that's an example of a conscious experience. Mm -hmm. If you remember a time that you were like vividly angry about something, sure. right? That's an example of a conscious experience you had. Mm -hmm. If you think about feeling hungry, if you think about opening your eyes and looking at something and having a visual experience, 
right? If you imagine a tune running through your head, all these things are examples of consciousness. And really, the, kind of the only way to define consciousness, I think, or the best way, is to say, well, it's stuff like that. Yeah, stuff like that. <laughs> stuff like that, right? And then you kind of have to hope that we agree. Okay, yeah, yeah we both glommed on to the same thing. Stuff yeah. like that, right? There's something obvious. I think there is an obvious property that all those things have in common that other stuff doesn't have. Doesn't have. Right? Yeah. Like a book doesn't have that going on right. in it, right? And you know, the growth of your toenails doesn't have that kind of stuff mm -hmm. going on in it. Mm -hmm. um, and even some of your brain processes don't have that kind of thing going sure. on in it. So, um, so yeah, so I think we define consciousness by example. Right, like you define furniture. Yeah, exactly. Right, you define you know, No one has an analytic definition of furniture, right? You just right. say, well, here's an example, here's an example, here's an example, right? These other things don't count, right? You get it? Right, right, right. So I think the only way to define consciousness really is by, by example. example. So, okay, well, let's take it a, a higher layer then. Yeah. Okay, so not individually. Do you think that there's a possibility of, like, say, a collective consciousness of sorts? Right. You know, like, um, it, you know, in, in, in integrated memory, because there's been some seri theories about like our, our anthropomorph or our p evolutionary past is that uh, every single primate is averse to snakes, like yeah. seeing it. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. so that people say that's our evolution, et cetera. But it's almost right. like a collective unconscious mm. or something or a consciousness. So is there a way yeah. that maybe a society can come be conscious or right. or maybe a company or say an idea of itself? Because it seems like once an idea gets going, like inertia is a SOB, you know, like once it gets going, it's yeah. hard to stop it. And so can, can something become conscious, an idea of sorts? Yeah. So um, I've argued that if some of the mainstream theories of consciousness that you see in philosophy and psychology and neuroscience are true, mm -hmm. then, uh, and you apply them to the case of the United States, then the result would be that the United States is consciousness, mm. is conscious by those standards, right? Right, so, right, right. So here's the idea, right? Think about the United States. I, I like, I choose the United States because it's, a, it's a, an example of a large entity with a lot of information exchange. Oh yeah, and it's been around for a little bit. It's, it's been around it's for a little bit. It's, it's, it's kind in of a bunch of places. It's got some <laughs> unity to it, right? So I, I like the example of the United States. You could do it with some other things yeah, too, sure. though. But, but think about the United States as a spatially distributed entity mm -hmm. in which people are parts, kind of like cells are part of your body, mm -hmm. right? So think of it as a spatially distributed entity like that, right? And then think, okay, there's a lot of information exchange among these people. This is an entity that has parts, lots of parts, yep. right? And if you take kind of standard theories of consciousness and you apply them to this entity, once you conceptualize the United States that way, it seems like the United States meets the criteria, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So there are a lot of theories of consciousness that trade on the idea that consciousness involves a certain kind of massive sharing of information Mm -hmm. in big recurrent loops, mm -hmm. maybe some kind of self-monitoring aspect of that too. Sure. Right? Oriented towards some sort of goal-directed action. Right. Well, the United States, this entity that I'm imagining now, the United States has massive information sharing, has massive self-representation, mm -hmm. has m organizes itself to do various things like invade Iraq and limit exports mm -hmm. and you know send someone to the moon and all kinds of things. So if you take these, a lot of these uh, standard theories of consciousness that you find in the literature and then apply them to that case, then it looks like those theories imply the United States is literally conscious. Right. Not metaphorically. Not, right? Uh, yeah, right, right, but right, right. It right, has right. an actual stream of experience over and above the experiences of its citizens. Wow. Now, what, can, what do you do with that? Yeah, you exactly. You say, well, those theories are right, and so, <laughs> hey, you know, Fantastic. the United States is conscious, and you might not have thought it, but science proves all kinds yeah. of exciting things. Oh, wait, yeah, <laughs> right? Way you know? crazy stuff, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All, you know, physics has some totally. pretty wild implications, you know, totally. so maybe consciousness science does too. You know, so that's one way you could go with it. Or another way you could go with it is to say, no, that's too absurd, right? There must be something wrong with these theories, mm -hmm. right? Another way you could go is say, no, look, you know, if you really look at the theory and you modify it appropriately to deal with this kind of case, then you'll find it doesn't really have that implication. Right. So there are a variety of ways you could go with that. Um, but I, don't, I wouldn't rule out the first 
reaction. Right, and and I think uh, one of the things that piggybacking off that, and we mentioned before, is um, I wrote a blog post about object-oriented ontology, triple O, and so it was made famous by Graham Harmon and the speculative realists of basically if you undermine something and break it down into its component parts, so if we give the example of the United States, you break it up into states, you break it up into citizens, you break it up into r infrastructure, et cetera, and then you uh, so if you undermine it that way, then you overmine it. What is its, you know, effects, if you will? Well, we've had a foreign policy, you know, doing X in the Middle East. Like we have certain viewpoints that have been doing, you know, whatever to Canada, Mexico. But then there is this this thing, this Heideggerian thing in itself that's just the third option, which is just the United States. Could that third table, if you will, in Heideggerian like talk of being something, a thing in itself, just be consciousness? And I don't, I'm mm. not trying to get too crazy or, or overlapped, right. but it's just an interesting thought experiment that it's like, it's, it's very similar. It, it kind of plays in the, it's, or at least to me, to, to a layman. So I don't right. know if you're, what's your thoughts on speculative realism, OOO, et cetera. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's hard to have a really, I think it's hard to justify a really confident opinion about the, these big picture metaphysical Very meta good point. Physical questions. Let's start with there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, yeah, we're, we're, we're hypoth yeah, we're riffing, people. We're riffing. Yeah, this is good. So, I, I mean, I'm inclined to think that there is an external world that's mm -hmm. independent of our minds. Yep. Right? Um, it has real properties that are independent of us. Um, it's got objects that exist independently of us and we have no like super privileged or special position within it. Right. Right. So that aspect of object oriented ontology seems to me pretty plausible. Yeah. Um, but I have to admit the other view does to me have a little bit of attraction. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that I'm interested in doing as a metaphysician mm -hmm. is thinking about possibilities that I think are probably not true, mm. but which I can't rule out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the way most people do metaphysics, the way it's usually done, is someone comes and says, okay, here's, here's what I think is right, here's the yeah. truth, right? Yeah. And they give you the truth. And I kind of like almost never, basically never, find those arguments <laughs> like fully convincing, right? Right, but there's always a something in there that just kind of doesn't I'm sit like, right. How do you know yeah, that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you know that? Yeah. Um, so I think another way of thinking about metaphysics is to think about not what is the truth, but what are some possible truths that are different from what I assume to, uh, to be the case. Mm -hmm. so and those may not necessarily be true in themselves. You are right. just trying to mess with it almost, like trying to get to that better viewpoint of how true something is. is. It, right. it just seems like you're, you're almost taking the scientific method approach in that, yeah, I have some great knowledge, I have some great intuitions, but there's always this chance that new information can come and then mess this entire thing up. Right, you yeah, know? for sure, right. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and I think in metaphysics we have pretty, you know, it's hard to know the kinds of questions that people dispute. It's hard to know mm -hmm. the answers to those questions. Um, so as someone who's kind of skeptical about that, I, there's this different kind of enterprise you can engage in, which is um, discovering possibilities you might not have thought of before. Totally. Even if you think they're probably not true. So let me give you just one example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is a, a paper I recently published called Kant Meets Cyberpunk. Okay, interesting. Right, so I love that name. <laughs> you describe object-oriented ontology. I think it's kind of opposed to a Kantian perspective. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so, and you know, ultimately, I think I probably favor something more in that direction. But mm -hmm. uh, there's this, but maybe not. So, okay, so we were talking about computation mm -hmm. before, right? One of the interesting things about the, you know, about the theory of computation um, if you go back to Turing's theory, which is basically standard, mm -hmm. uh, is that it does not require spatiality. Mm. It doesn't require that the computational transformations take place in space. It probably requires temporality, right, in the sense, in order to have computation, you need to have state transitions from one, one state to another state. Oh, sure, right? yes, yes, phase, yes, yes, yes. So, um, so, let's see, how do I, what's the best way to enter this? Okay, so have you, uh, do you know about the simulation hypothesis? Of course, yes, of course. Right. 
Of course, so who doesn't? The, <laughs> Nick Bostrom, we, right? Yeah, right, yeah, 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 exactly. yeah. Nick Bostrom. So this is the idea that we, we might be living inside of a computer. Yeah. Right? So the idea is, well, look, you know, if you set aside surly and wor worries, mm -hmm. John Searle's mm -hmm. worries, right, and other kinds of worries, you know, maybe computers could be conscious. Mm -hmm. And if computers could be conscious, then maybe some of their subparts could be conscious. And we could be those subparts, mm -hmm. you know, living inside of computers with almost like, you know, in the program The Sims, mm -hmm. right? those little AI programs. We could be like them, mm -hmm. right, in these artificial environments. Well, anyway, ho hopefully your viewers know a little bit about it. Yeah, that. yeah, they, they get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Simulation right. theory. Yeah, right, right. right. So yeah. we could be artificial intelligences living inside of computers. I do not think this is likely. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know that we can totally rule it out. Right. All right. Next step is computers don't have to be material. Mm. Right? It's not part of the theory of computation that computers are material. Mm -hmm. right? In fact, Hilary Putnam, the uh, famous philosopher, says, look, you could make a computer out of ectoplasm, soul stuff. Right, right. right? You can make a computer out of an immaterial soul, a Cartesian angel. Yes, yes, yes. Right? Okay. So what if we are entities instantiated in a computer program and the fundamental underlying layer of the computer program is immaterial. Mm. It's a, a Cartesian angel or something like that. Right. Right. Then, spatiality would not be a fundamental part of the universe. All of the things we see around us in the kind of empirically given world mm -hmm. would be things that are effects of the way the computer is structured. Right. And the computer is structured very differently at a fundamental light level. So right. spatiality in the empirical world would be something about how we, something about us, something about how we experience mm. this reality that at the fundamental level is radically different from right. our experience of it. And that fundamental reality might be unknowable to us because all of our empirical science is, is within this spatiality that arises as a, uh, as a result of something radically different underneath. Right. So, and that's getting in the direction, it's not full-blown Kant. No, no, but that's it. But, but it's getting in the direction oh, totally. of Kant, right? So you've got this kind of, um, this phenomenal world of spatial, spatiality and appearances. Science is completely constrained to that world, and, but behind it there's some noumenal uh, uh, way of things that is radically different and unknowable to us. Yeah. Right. So, you know, so I think thinking about that weird possibility, which yes. I think is very unlikely to be true, right? but thinking about that weird possibility and thinking, well, you know, I can't totally rule that out, I think opens us up, or at least it opens me up, to, to a Kantian perspective in general. Totally. Right? Like, okay, I'm inclined toward an object-oriented ontology in which, you know, there really is material stuff independent of us, right? right? But like, I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe Khan is right. Maybe, maybe there's some kind of, it's all kind of a phenomenal world that doesn't really track on to very well what's going on underneath. Right. And we're all kind of, we're kind of in this bubble of appearances. Right. And then, so, so that's so interesting because like the first thing I thought of when you said that is like the th are the unknown unknowns, the things that we yeah, will, yeah. Uh, you know, kind of never know. And right. then it's like, you know, I, I think the easiest way to put that I for viewers is um, the question of, well, everyone knows about the Big Bang, but when, like, what did the Big Bang explode into? You know what I mean? <laughs> and right. it's like, we, well, that may be outside of our purview right. forever. Like, right, right. It, you know, who knows? But uh, right. like, and so, but do I think? But do I think that us probing that question, yeah. even though we may not never know the answer or may not be on the right path, I think that may offshoot us to another more logical or more likely answer. That it's so funny that now, I mean, now we we think about the great scattering of light. I mean, three hundred eighty thousand years after the Big Bang, it, everything was you know translucent. Everything was white because yeah. of the you know, and so you can't really see, the, our telescopes can only go back to this great wall of light, which is 380,000 years after. And it's like, well, 
there's something there, but there's yeah. not <laughs> exact. You know what I mean? In, so, yeah, in right. some level, and so I just think yeah. that that's interesting. And so uh, one one post that I just recently did is consilience. You know, the oh, unity yeah. of all knowledge, and right. I've set it up in the way that Donald Rumsfeld, his famous. Uh, a known known speech, you know, right, I, so I right, sped right, it up right. as that. So known knowns is things that we know, we know like science and, you know, material things, or at least pretty much so. Right. Um, unknown knowns is thi or things that um, we might have, you know, used to know or lost knowledge, et cetera. But uh, this fascinating question of unknown unknowns, like right. what, what are some of those other things that, I mean, because you deal in knowledge, you deal right. in epistemology and things like that. Is it, are we ever going to get out of that as humans? Or is that something no, that we even, I don't yeah. think so. Okay. So, <laughs> so this is, I thought I got, this is a, uh, I thought I got this paraphrase from David Hume and I tried to chase it down and I okay. realized I completely blew it up in my mind. So <laughs> okay. this is vaguely located in, in David Hume. Uh, but I mean, I, one metaphor I like for it or analogy I like for it is that we're, we're like fleas on the back of a dog. Mm -hmm. watching a hair grow, saying, ah, so that's the structure of the universe. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Your, your, your frame of reference. It, okay, here's another <laughs> anecdote. Uh, when you go into the ocean and dip a cup of water in and say there's no whales in the ocean because there's no whales in the cup, it's like, you need a larger sample size there, buddy. <laughs> you know I mean? like, a larger cup, too. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. Yeah, yeah. Right, so, I mean... A lot of cosmologists think the universe might be infinite. We, I mean, we don't know whether the yeah, universe yeah. is infinite. But, I mean, if the universe is infinite, then, you know, you know, who knows what's going on out there beyond our purview or whether we're, we're like, just seeing yeah. air, whether we're a tiny little speck in some giant's mustache or yeah, something, right? Yeah, something like that. Um, so, yeah, we don't know. And 200 years ago, no one would have thought oh, we might be simulations living inside of a computer. They didn't have the conception Very of good a computer, right? So 200 years from now, what kinds of things do we not yet have a conception of that might introduce skeptical possibilities that we, we don't even, we can't even imagine yet? Exactly. I, I think one of the ones for me that changed things was uh, in the 1920s when Edwin Hubble found out that that star was actually a galaxy. Oh, yeah. And that just like our phase change, like you said, just changed immediately from stars. Oh, those are stars. Those are suns. To then galaxies. Like, wait, what? Like, that's just a <laughs> yeah. different kind of thing. And so, uh, speaking of, do, are you familiar? You're familiar with the Drake par or the Drake equation, the Fermi yes. paradox. Do you uh -huh. have any thoughts on that, like philosophically? Because the the gist is is that the mm. math is un the the math is so for the possibility of intelligent and sentient beings being in just this galaxy, not, not alone, n not just the universe, but just millions upon intelligent species of aliens, if you will, just in the Milky Way. But then we look around and the universe is very, very big, but it's also very old. And then so Enrico Fermi, Fermi basically said, well, where is everybody? Yeah. yeah so like, wh where what's your kind of thoughts on that? On the, um, Do you think it's great filters? Like of that? Yeah. So I don't, I'm, you know, I tend to be skeptical. Yeah, sure. and I tend to like hypotheses that have many disjunctions, many okay. parts. Okay. Right? Yes, so yes, yes. So I don't, I don't, I don't have a strong, confident answer to where are they or uh, what the what the solution is right. to um, the Fermi's paradox. But I do, I do think that we should take seriously the idea that the great filter, as they say, is in front of us, right? And here's one reason to take it seriously. Um, that I think is somewhat underappreciated in the literature on Fermi's paradox, which is that um, as organisms get bigger relative to their environment, okay, they're more subject to catastrophic risk. Great point. Right. Huge dinosaurs. Huge everything. Yeah. Cataclysms yeah. of that nature. Right. That, that's or at least in our purview that that's what we have. So when you have small, simple wow. organisms and they're really small relative to giant environments and you've got other versions of that species way over there that are not subject to the same kind of say disease risks or right. climate risks or any other kinds of risks. Then, you know, you wipe out this one, you know, others will come up and others are already going on over there. As the organisms get larger and more complicated and the parts become more interdependent with each other, then there's more risk. Mm. And as the, as the, the lar organisms go lar grow larger relative to their environment, there's more risk. Mm -hmm. Well, and this gets back to the United States, right, okay. as a potentially conscious organism. Ah, right? yes. I think that, 
um, that there's a sense in which the human life is becoming part of a superorganism on this planet, mm -hmm. right? Right. Right. And this, at some point, <laughs> right, it might be a natural. So one of the tendencies that you see in evolution is for um, larger systems to congeal out of smaller ones, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we might be in for some sort of, uh, or it might be generally the case, right, that uh, systems on planets far away generally get larger and larger and more complex until they become basically superorganisms mm -hmm. that are the size of the planets, planets they're on, yeah, yeah. right? And then any risk that kills the organism yeah. is can the end. Yeah, can do any, yeah, any risk at that level is a is species ending thing. Right, or, or right. so a death is an extinction. Right. Right. A single death right. is an extinction. Good point, right? good point. So um, in addition to all the usual kinds of, uh, so that's a version of the kind of great filters mm -hmm. in, front of us, mm -hmm. in front of us theory, um, right? The, the increasing interdependence of us and maybe of any kind of organism in a complicated organism in a planetary environment, right? You get these medium-term benefits from interdependence, right? Right. You get these medium-term benefits. If you can offload one task, if, a, if an entity can offload one task onto another entity and become a specialist, then both entities might benefit. Oh, right, in the evolution, yeah, yeah. Right, up right, so you get, these, yes, yes, you get yes. these, right, there's the, the cooperation and the interdependence and the specialization provide these me medium-term benefits. And so entities that offload tasks to each other can now compete entities that are not specialist jack-of-all-trade entities. Right, 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 right. But then, in the long term, okay. those systems that are interdependent then are subject to kinds of risks, right? So they outcompete right. the non-specialist systems, right? But then eventually are subject long-term to some kind of catastrophic. And that's risk. almost at every layer because you could say that from like, I mean, countries to then the size of the planet, but then even if we get multi-planeted, then it's like, but our organism would then be as big as a solar system, and then still those solar system level type things could then mess, yeah, with the risk. It would depend on the amount of interdependence, yeah. Wow, very interesting. Well, cool, we're gonna take a short break, and uh, when we get back, more from Eric schwartz -Gable. Thank you. Welcome back to Eclectic Spacewalk Conversations. I'm still here with my guest, Eric schwartz -Gable, and uh, professor of philosophy at the University of California, Riverside. Um, so we talked a lot about consciousness at first, uh, and now we're going to just finish up our conversation about consciousness, excuse me, is um, what are your thoughts philo philosophically about altered states of consciousness? Um, like humans, you know, actively seeking that out. Uh, what, I mean, that could be through psychedelics, that could be holotropic breath work, or as benign as, say, caffeine and booze and pot. So what is yeah. kind of like a philosophical outlook on changing your consciousness? Right. Well... Every night we go, we dream. Very good point. Very good point. <laughs> right, yeah. and it's pretty clear that the brain state and the state of consciousness in dreaming is pretty different from right. ordinary waking consciousness. So, you know, the idea that what we think of as typical waking waking consciousness is the only way the brain could be is kind of obviously not true. Yeah, yeah. So then, you know, so then one of the questions is, okay, so we've got, you know, indisputably at least these two kinds of states, right, or what we think of as a normal waking state and the dream state, and what other possibilities are there, mm -hmm. um, and I don't see why we should not think there aren't a whole bunch of possibilities. Certainly people report very different kinds of experiences when they're on drugs of various sorts or in meditative practice or in, during extreme life events mm -hmm. or as a result of cultural rituals. So, yeah, I think we should explore all that and take right. that stuff seriously, yeah. Very interesting. And then, um, so, what we're going to now just talk, I, I want you to hear, like, kind of your, I guess you could say uh, one, you don't have to do one word, but maybe a phrase, uh, <laughs> yeah. is, um, so I'm going to just kind of rattle off some of the things that kind of you're into, yeah. uh, or at least have said you're into. <laughs> so, uh, just tell me, like, first thing that comes to mind, uh, philosophy of psychology. My dad. Yeah. We were okay. just talking about Yeah, that. yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> Philosophy of mind. What's the first thing? 
Um, no right answers here, Eric. <laughs> no right answers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not used to these speed things. Yeah, 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 speed things. I'm a slow, yeah, yeah, slow thinking. Philosopher. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, so what, what's uh, philosophy of mind is a very... It's that the mind is so weird and so different than we normally think it oh, is. Oh, I like that. Okay. Um, metaphysics, so like first principles. Um, I think of wonder, philosophical wonder. Oh, okay, philosophical wonder. I like that. Yeah. Um, epistemology, kind of similar, but not the same. Oh, I think about doubt. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. Okay, okay. So the theory of knowledge and then thinking that, you know, there's some sort of doubt in there. Yeah, I like the epistemology of doubt. Yeah, okay. Um, moral psychology. Here I think about the question of whether thinking philosophically can have any influence on your real world moral choices. Mm. This is something I've been thinking about a lot. A lot. Okay, well, we'll come back to that. Um, and then what about uh, science fiction? Because I know we've briefly talked about that. But what's the first thing that kind of comes to mind when you think science fiction? Uh, I think about its potential as a form of philosophy. Uh, that it's undervalued as a way of thinking philosophically. Wow, okay, very good. Okay, so then let's, uh, okay, last one. We'll come back to some of these. Uh, yeah. Ancient Chinese philosophy. I can't help but think about Zhuangzi, who's my, one of my, maybe my favorite philosopher. Okay, ever. okay, yeah. Zhuangzi, and, okay. Uh, he's just so radically weird. <laughs> I like that, radically weird, love yeah. it. Okay, so then let's, let's parse out some of these. Um, so you so let's go right back in ancient Chinese philosophy. What for like I mean this is a lot typically Western. I mean I, I pride myself on eclectic spacewalk being from all over, and we have a lot of listeners uh, from anywhere and everywhere. But maybe for a typical like Western audience, what should they know more of in ancient Chinese philosophy? And then what is ancient Chinese philosophy's maybe blind spots to modernity? You know, because it's ancient. <laughs> Obviously, they don't know much about computers. Yeah, no, no, not not much, not much. But so, what are what for, what are, what do what do Westerners or what do normal people kind of need to know about ancient Chinese philosophy that that could right. kind of help? Well, I think um, there are two things in ancient Chinese philosophy that I really have thought about a lot and love. And one of the things I mentioned is, is Zhuangzi and his wonderful weirdness. But I, I'll actually answer with the other thing. Um, which is the moral psychology of ancient Chinese philosophy. Mm -hmm. There's this wonderful debate between two ancient Confucians, Mengzi and, and Shunzi, mm -hmm. um, that is translated into English as the debate about whether human nature is good or human nature is evil. Mm, okay. And Mengzi said that human nature is good. Uh, and by this, I think he meant, right, this is open to a lot of interpretation. Sure, right? sure. But I think he meant something like, we all, everybody, like literally everybody, except for maybe social psychopaths, right? Mm -hmm. But basically, literally everybody is such that if they thought and they reflected, they would find in themselves a moral compass that tells them right from wrong, and they'd find in themselves the impulse to choose mm -hmm. what's right and to reject what's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and that moral development is a matter of, it's best helped at least by turning your attention inward and reflecting on those impulses you all have and acting on them and nurturing them. Um, and it connects with what I was saying about my father mm -hmm. with his street corner research. Right? Sure, sure. So I think the, the perspective that is implicit in that is somewhat uh, Mengzian or, or Menchian um, in that when these teenagers who were involved in crime were given an opportunity for an hour every week or three times a week for unstructured reflection. Mm, right. They found in themselves that they wanted to do what's right and to develop morally and make the right kinds of choices. And what they needed was the space outside of the pressures of the day-to-day -day choices right. to find that in themselves. And is that, would that be as one word, a conscience? Not a consciousness, right. but a conscience, you know what I mean? Like yeah, those little, like you know, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, little yeah. angel and the little devil saying like, hey, you shouldn't do that, or hey, you should, I mean, yeah, yeah, some yeah. sort of that, yeah. Yeah, something like that. There's not, I think, an ancient Chinese word that exactly captures the Western okay. notion of conscience, but, um, but yeah, in that direction. Okay. Um, 
Yeah. And then Shunzi says, no way, human nature is bad. bad. <laughs> right? Basically, um, we, we're, we basically have self-serving impulses. Mm -hmm. And morality is an artificial social construction. And what you need to do is learn how to change yourself to become morally better by making yourself into something artificial that you aren't naturally. Mm. And one of the wonderful things, so Mung's is really interesting, you know, as in his articulation of human nature and being good, I think is very nice. Shun's is also very interesting on the other side. And he differs from most people who say human nature is bad. Kind of, it's a kind of pessimistic view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But Shun's is not pessimistic at all, really. Right. right? Um, he thinks that we have a profound capacity to transform ourselves artificially, that human beings become, it's natural in some sense, for us to become artificial. Right. And that if you engage in the right kind of social, cultural practices, you can come to a state where at the end, everything you desire, everything you want, every choice you make spontaneously is toward the right. Oh, wow. So he says at the end of his first chapter, uh, he says, you know, you, you can come to a, a, a part where your, where your eyes desire nothing but to look at what's right, your ears desire nothing but to hear what's right, your heart desires nothing but to choose what's right. Mm. And, and he's, there he's harking back to um, this famous fragment from uh, Confucius or Kongza, uh, where he, de he, he briefly describes his moral development. He says, at age 15, he set his heart on learning. Mm -hmm. And then he goes through a few phases. And they're all interesting, actually. But then, at the end, Confucius says, and at age 70, I could follow my heart's desire without overstepping the bounds of propriety. Wow, so it took him 55, 55 years. 55 years. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. After 55 yeah. years, <laughs> after 55 years, yeah. you know, of, the Confu of Confucian practice, sure. right, you could become somebody who is so radically transformed by your culture that every choice you make is spontaneously appropriate and perfect. Wow. That's very interesting. Right? But it's not at all natural. It's yes, all yes, artificial. Yes. It's all something learned. It's all something through cultural learning. So that shows this picture. Okay. And then so it piggybacks on a lot of the things that we were just talking about, moral psychology, because when I, when I think of that, it immediately becomes like, you know, business ethics almost. You yeah. know, like, why are we doing the certain things and how do we know what is right or wrong? Um, but then you, you mentioned in, in a, sec a second ago about what even philosophy can do to a normal person or, right. or, or what they can utilize for that. So maybe just riff on that of like, well, you know, not exactly what is the point of philosophy or maybe what, uh, like, but how yeah. much can someone value from just thinking philosophically, I guess, is the easiest way to put it. Right. And I have so many different reactions to that question. <laughs> <laughs> That's I'm good. I'm not sure which one to take. That's well, good. Well, let, me first, let me first say one thing and then I'll say okay. another thing, which is maybe closer to what you were thinking about. The first thing I want to say is that I don't think philosophy has to have any instrumental value for anything else. Mm. I think one of the most amazing things about planet Earth is that there are these things that are kind of basically bags of complicated water. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that Meat can, vehicles. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That can stop <laughs> and think about some of the hardest most profound, weirdest, most remote questions. Sure. And, you know, a planet that has stuff like that going on is intrinsically already a much more interesting, much better planet than a planet that just has a bunch of bacteria sure. on it. Yeah, or a planet yeah. that has a bunch of cows on it, right? The fact that we are capable of philosophical reflection is an amazing thing about us and about our planet, and it doesn't need there doesn't need to be any other purpose that it serves. Right, right. So that's the first thing. When people talk about the value of philosophy, one of the things that I want to do is just first affirm that, right? So I think philosophy may also have <laughs> instrumental value, right? But, but on top of having instrumental value, it has, I think, intrinsic value. I mean, I mean, what in the world does have intrinsic value if not, totally. if not that? Right. So that's one reaction. The other yeah. reaction is... Yeah. <laughs> to play down its instrumental value a little bit, or at least, well, I don't want to say that. No, that's not the right way to go. The, well, one thing I've noticed. Yeah. I've done a whole bunch, I'm, I've done a whole bunch of 
empirical research on the moral behavior of ethics professors. Sh okay, I read, saw, saw, saw a yeah. little bit of this. This was interesting because it's like even to have even to construct something like this, how would you do it, et cetera? But then this is great because yeah. you make something empirical from some nonsensical data, really, that people thought of before. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I got into that question by thinking about the debate between Meng Zhe and Shen Zhe in human nature mm -hmm. and thinking about, I mean, one way of reading Shen Zhe, of Meng Zhe Mencius that I think is not necessarily exactly right, but maybe is right, is, you know, to think that, well, if you engage in a lot of philosophical reflection, then you should probably behave morally better, right? Because mm -hmm. thinking and reflecting about ethical issues, you should discover what's right, and then you should kind of want to do it, right? But who engages in more philosophical reflection about ethical issues than ethics professors? Yeah. All right, like, yeah. well, I mean, a few people, maybe, yeah, maybe, priest, maybe. priests, maybe, you know, or, <laughs> but, you know, or maybe, you know. But they take the cake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe your uncle who spends a lot of time yeah. reflecting about right. moral issues, right? But, you know, on average, <laughs> right, ethics professors spend a lot of time thinking about these things. But it also had seemed to me like, they just behave like normal people of their social group. Sure. Right, that was my impressionistic sense. So, yeah, Josh Rust and I, he's another philosopher uh, at Stetson University, we did this whole long series of empirical experiments on mm -hmm. the moral behavior of ethics professors, and we found over and over again, like we did 17 different ex dependent measures, right? We, over and over again, the ethicists don't behave differently mm -hmm. than other comparison groups, like other right. philosophers who don't specialize in ethics or professors uh, at the same universities in other departments. Um, so, and I find that kind of disappointing, mm. right? Because because you would think, the yeah, 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 you the would. The part of me yeah. that that likes, Manch I mean, I love Shunza too, right? <laughs> but the part of me that really wants Manchus to be right and really wants it to be the case that thinking philosophically about ethics can kind of like open doors and make you yeah, yeah. ethically better. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, like yeah, it's totally. part of the, I mean, why do we have business ethics classes? Why do we have ethics as a requirement in the university? Why do we want to read ethicists, right? It seems like implicitly, not for everybody, but implicitly part of the project is the hope that thinking about ethics will like yeah. make you discover what's ethically right and then consequently make you a little more likely to choose what's right. But that doesn't seem to be what we see if we use ethics professors as our kind of empirical wedge into that issue. Right, right. Um, and it's I an interesting yeah. experiment. Yeah, yeah. I, I like it. I mean, to, 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 yeah. to go off of that, I mean, so from, from those type of exper experiments, like experiments, how, how hard is it to like take a question like that, like some premise? You know, you're reading and you're like, actually, that seems really interesting. I want to look, dive into that. And it's like, you, well, you can't just dive in. You have to create, <laughs> yeah. you know, certain types of protocols, et cetera. Yeah. Like, what was that kind of, take us through, you don't have to spend too much time on it, but, but how was that process, you know, of coming, what was the timeline like? Did it right. ta take months? Did it take years? Years. Years. So, I mean, one of the things about studying real moral behavior is that there is, it's impossible to study well. Right, yeah, right, because just inherently because, Inherently yeah. impossible because if you do a really controlled study with people in a laboratory, then great, you got a good control, but what you got is like people behaving in a laboratory oh, knowing they're being studied, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. But if you <laughs> do a kind of observational study of people as they behave in their ordinary life, right, then you lack the kinds of experimental controls that you would want. Yes, yes, right? yes. Then plus, you know, it's hard to know why people do what they do and people when they're behaving morally or immorally sell themselves in certain mm -hmm, ways mm -hmm. and it's hard to detect real moral choice. You know, so there's, there's no good way to do it. Right. So what you need to do is you need to do lots of bad studies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like many, many <laughs> bad studies. <laughs> to figure out <laughs> All <what> of <laughs> which, right, and if you're lucky, as I got lucky, if, they're, if you're lucky and all the bad studies kind of converge to a certain explanation. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Then you can yeah. say, well, look, you know, this study's got this problem. Of course it does. It's not going to show you anything by itself, right? It's got that problem. But this is what it kind of suggests. Right? Here's this other study. It's got a totally different set of problems. Yeah. But it also kind of suggests the same thing. Right? Here's this other study with still a different set of problems. Yeah. But it also kind of suggests yeah. the same thing. Right? And once you get eight studies that are totally different methodologies and they all kind of point in the same direction even though each one of them kind of has a, some problems at the end you kind of get this picture that hangs together yeah sure and i think you know but it doesn't always work out that way no, sometimes no, you know totally. the studies go this way and other studies of go that course. way and then you who know but you know with the ethics professor stuff so far 
all the studies have kind of said the same thing, despite their different flaws, uh, which is that ethicists behave basically the same as everybody else. Right. Um, and now some other labs have basically found pretty similar results. Uh, so, yeah, so it was, a, it was a matter of years of kind of trying lots of different kind of stupid things. Like yeah, the very yeah. first thing we did was we were just curious, are ethics books more likely to be stolen from academic libraries? <laughs> Very good point. Yeah, like where can we start? Yeah, yeah it's oh yeah, just yeah. like we got yeah. books that were comparable, ethics books and, and non-ethics <laughs> books that were similar in age and popularity, checkout rate and stuff sure. like that. We kind of matched them, and you know, in that case, actually, the ethics books were a little more likely to be missing. But that, but that was the only study we found where there was a negative effect for ethics. Very yeah. interesting. Um, um, but yeah, so like, just kind of like, well, that's one piece of evidence. I mean, it would be unreasonable to draw any big conclusions totally, from that totally. one, right? But you know. But it fits. It fits. Yeah. Okay. Well, as they say for UPS, if it fits, it ships. You know, <laughs> we're ready. So, um, science fiction. This yeah. has been one of my things I really wanted to talk to you about because yeah. science fiction was kind of, it really opened me up to I think philosophy yes. and from the side that like I was a journalist, I was a curious thinker, etc. But then reading, you know, sci-fi books with Arthur C. Clarke, Ursula K. Le Guin, like things yeah. like that, and uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, yeah. those kinds of uh, things can really open my mind. And so first I wanted to talk to you about, I guess we can, this is a good segue between your ancient Chinese philosophy and science fiction is the most popular Chinese science fiction book for Western audiences, The Three Body Problem. Right. And so Chixin Li, fantastic book series. I fell in love with that, but one of the first things for me to understand about ancient Chinese philosophy was some of the stuff that they had in that it was just such an interesting dichotomy is that they're talking about space and they're talking about science and yeah. you know these far-flung lands and then but they still had such a strong connection to the Confucius and Sun Tzu and you know right. that kind of ancient so, so what I wanted to talk to you about was more so obviously science fiction can be a tool can be a vehicle of some of these philosophical ideas but how important is science fiction moving forward to maybe the future of philosophy, of philosophies that we don't know yet, almost, you know? Or, or is it right. at the cutting edge? Uh, um, and then, you know, what are your favorite science fiction, you know, books that yeah. you peruse on the side? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, here's one thing that I've recently been thinking. Um, I mean, when we think of philosophy, we normally think of expository essays where you have a bunch of sentences that are presented as truths that you know stack together as an argument toward a conclusion mm -hmm. but I don't know that we have to think of philosophy uh, as taking that form and those are what aphorisms as they call them no no like, no oh, not aphorisms oh, I just okay, mean so an just, oh okay just so an just in anything just like an essay. okay perfect right so um, yeah I mean I don't think philosophy has to be an expository essay so you know when you think about great works of some great works of science fiction, like some of Arthur C. Clarke's work, mm -hmm. um, or for me a really personally important uh, work was uh, Greg Egan's Diaspora. Okay, I heard of it, never heard yeah. of it, yeah, Diaspora. Um, that kind of, when I first read that book, that rekindled my interest in science fiction, which had laid latent, um, you know, between my teenage years uh -huh. and, you know, maybe about age 40. Sure. And I read that book and I was just, amazed at how philosophically rich it was. Sure. And I was like, wow, I gotta read more science fiction. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, no, a work like that, uh, or a work like Borges's Labyrinths, mm, okay. uh, which yeah. isn't maybe exactly science fiction, but it's certainly speculative fiction. Um, I think of those as philosophy, just as much philosophy as an essay is. And I think some of the best philosophy uh, is sometimes done through science fiction. Like one example, I think, Black, the series Black Mirror, oh, the TV of course. series. Oh my gosh, yeah. I think they're doing some of the best work on the ethics of technology. Oh my right? gosh, yeah. Very you look at point. philosophers who Very are writing point. essays about ethics of technology, there's some great stuff there, but I don't think Black Mirror is less great uh, as a way of exploring philosophical issues in the ethics of technology than, you know, essays by philosophers. No, that's a very good point because then, the, the, like, I don't, yeah, what is that? Is that because they see themselves, you know, and they can, they actually see something and they can visualize through cinema themselves in it or something that rather than writing? Yes, right, right, right. You know, like, I don't know, yeah, why yeah. would that be? Yeah, so this is one thing I've been thinking about recently. So um, partly in the context, 
I'm putting together an anthology. Okay. With perfect. a couple anthologies. Perfect, actually. perfect. One of them is with Helen de Cruz and Johan de Smet. Oh, Helen de Cruz. Yeah, I follow you know her, her on Twitter. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah Philosophical yeah. Cocoon or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Her blog post. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, she and Johan and I are putting together an anthology of news stories, mostly news stories, half written by philosophers. Okay. Half written by science fiction authors. Okay. Uh, science fiction stories. We're going to call it, or we are calling it, uh, uh, um, philosophy through science fiction stories. Okay. And one of the things that we're thinking about in the introduction to that to that anthology uh, is how is it that fiction works as philosophy? Mm, yeah. Very good point. Right. Very good point. Yeah. Um, one of the ways that I think, so here's here's a way of, of here's an entree into that issue, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of philosophers use thought experiments. Sure. Right, so the most famous of them probably re these days is the trolley problem. Yep, very right? yep. This is runaway trolley, <laughs> it's gonna hit five people unless you do something. You know, you can flip a switch and then it'll go into a sidetrack where there's one person, should you flip the switch and kill the one person to save the five, right? And then there are various versions on it which you push somebody in front of the well, trolley. That, I, those are my favorite, because then it's like you gotta actively do it or not do it, like, you know, right. oh, it's great. Uh, so, oh. like, <laughs> why do philosophers do that? So here's, so, so here's the question, right? Like, you could, if, if you're arguing for an ethical position, why do you need to tell the story? Oh, right? Why okay. does there need to be like a trolley? Right. Why right. do there need to be five people on the track? Why, why not just like do abstract positions? Well, there's something about thought experiments that engages our imagination, mm. engages our emotions, gives a, a vividness and reality to it that you miss when you just say abstract things like act on that maxim that you can will to be a universal law. That's Kant, right. right? Or maximize utility, maximize happiness, right? That's some version of Mill, right? Those abstract propositions, they're hard, their minds are not good at them, mm -hmm. right? What our minds are good at is social cognition and stories and emotion and imagination, but that's right? almost like your consciousness, you see it. Like it's yeah, that, yeah, like right. I see it, it's that. And then, and then it's real, right? And then it's real, and then you can evaluate it philosophically in a way that's so hard to evaluate some abstract proposition. No, totally. Right? So, okay, so I, that, I think that's what's going on, right? And then, and then once you think about the thought experiment, like the paragraph long thought experiment in that way, right, then maybe you could realize, as I think, well, I think realize, that those thought experiments are really an intermediate point on a continuum, right? On one end of the continuum are really abstract propositions like maximize good consequences. On the far other end of the continuum are right, full length, richly developed fictions like a feature length movie mm, or mm -hmm. a TV series mm -hmm. or a novel, right? And the philosophical thought experiment is somewhere in the middle between those things. And what we should do as philosophers, I think, is utilize the entire range, right? Because there are some there are some epistemic advantages and some to thinking abstractly. Sure. Right? You cut away a lot of detail that might be distracting, for example. Yep, yep, right? yep. And there are some other epistemic advantages that come with like fully engaging the imagination and fully engaging the emotions. Right? So you don't do it just one way. You bring right. all of your tools Absolutely. to the table. Right? And so, right, just like an abstract article is a piece of philosophy. A novel, a Le Guin novel, mm -hmm. or Greg Egan, or whoever, mm -hmm. right, is can be a piece of philosophy. And I th another thing too that I'm thinking of is the difference between like reading it, and then you almost mm -hmm. have to have the inst or the inclination to world build, you know, almost in your mind, and that's yeah. fantastic. But then if you see it, you're almost seeing an interpretation from someone else, but you are more like viscerally yes. like there. So again, like you said, there's a spectrum. There's right, a whole right, right. thing that we should be utilizing rather than like, okay, well, this is what we're doing. These these thought experiments that it's X or this or right, that. Right, it, right. No, I agree. Film brings you in in a certain way that prose doesn't. In mm -hmm. a, I mean, it, prose can be so immersive, right? But it doesn't, it, to the extent it brings you in, it brings you in in a different kind of way. Totally. And so prose has certain advantages over film. And film has certain advantages over prose. And so, yeah, I think we should use both. Perfect. Yeah. One of the two, two of my favorite uh, science fiction, we'll just briefly talk about these, and they deal with some of these problems, um, or not problems, but you know, thought experiments, if you will, is um, 
Ex Machina, obviously mm. with the Turing test, so we didn't get into that uh, before, but yeah. Ex Machina I thought was a very more, much more like realist kind of interpretation of like, well, it's kind of up to them at that point. You know, <laughs> if they get to that point, like right. they don't really care about you in the soundproof, you know, basement or whatever. So right. I guess like, I mean, did you feel, did you think that that was a good approximation of the Turing? Because again, like, yeah. You wouldn't have to read Alan Turing's thing. You could just watch the movie Ex Machina at the end. It's like, do you understand what the Turing problem is? Do you understand like where those kind of things? I mean, I just yeah. I'm I'm very interested to hear in like, I guess you could say the better forms because there's been there's a lot of science fiction out there. Right. But like, what what is the good science fiction? I think that's even harder to to really do because yeah. it is so lofty of a goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Ex Machina is a wonderful film. Yeah, and it's a dark film. Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> right? Well, so what do you, you know, if if we create artificial intelligence that is more powerful than us, as Nick Bostrom, you mentioned yeah, that before, yeah, yeah. suggests, you know, there's there are risks in that that we should take seriously. Yeah. Well, piggybacking on the other side of that is my other favorite film is Arrival. So uh, that's yeah, like yeah, yeah, the yeah. opposite of that is that you know if we it's not this come together kumbaya moment. It's it's a literal like outside of our purview alien species and then yeah. you know it's it obviously there's always this giant instigator to bring us together in any type of like content nowadays but i thought arrival was a very big message that's not that you know yeah, that's yeah. not a realist it is like well no us humans can figure it out you know there's something more than just ones and zeros that we can kind of like become more than i guess yeah. you could say one of the things i really like about arrival and even more so, I don't know if you've read the original story, Ted Chiang's story, this, it's called Story of Your Life. I haven't, but I've heard, Ted Chiang keeps coming up as, he's great. as he's wonderful. new science fiction of a, not a utopic, but a more, he's trying that, that sliver that no one's occupied lately. He's very philosophical, and it's sometimes it's easy to be dark. Mm, yes, right? yes, yes, good point. Um, and he, one of the things I like about Chiang is he's often not, he doesn't go for the easy thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so one thing about Arrival that I like, and, and I think even more so in the original story on which it's based, is the idea that minds, an alien mind, could be really different from our own. Mm, yes. It's fundamentally different from our own in how it thinks and how it communicates. And it's a wonderful story in giving you a feeling for that and actually working out some of the details of a possible alternative language, right? So in the original story, you know, so if you see the movie, there's the, there are these rings oh, with cool. a little, yeah, 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 right? Yeah. But in, in the original story, he talks about the grammar of it and a lot of detail. There's a oh, lot okay. of linguistics about okay. like how these things work. And he does this wonderful job, this really nerdy linguistics kind of job of like, okay, like how would a, a language that was atemporal, where the sentence is just right there on the page all in a single yeah, moment, yeah. how would that work, right? And how, what would an adverb be? What yeah, would a verb, yeah, well, you know, yeah. how does that kind of stuff work? And, uh, you know, he gives you this trip into a really alien way of thinking that I think opens up to kind of bring back to some of the stuff we were talking about earlier, opens up this kind of sense of possibilities mm. and the sense of wonder. Like mm. what we think of as normal is, you know, just one of the many, many ways entities in this universe could be yeah right so you know it's always to me a little bit disappointing when you read science fiction and the aliens are basically you know humans with you know funny faces or oh whatever. sure <laughs> yeah like per just perturbed a little bit to make a <laughs> right. semi-human yeah 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 you know because there are so many different ways that uh, an alien species might think. Oh yeah, I mean just thinking about like, it's so funny when people, and I, I was guilty of this for many, many years, of being so fascinated with what's outside of our own world and like the alien prospects. Yeah. But then you go look at a squid and it's like, what the hell is that? You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, and, then, yeah, yeah. and then you understand that octopuses and squids, like they have a different type of consciousness yeah. that split from us very, way, way, way back. And yeah. actually they have, a semi like proto conscious like kind of master of you know whatever at, at the actual brain but then each of its limbs are each conscious in their own semi proto conscious maybe, way of themselves yeah, yeah well, that's what the theories are and right, it's like right. that alone but that's here that's that's right out there in the ocean you know right, and, right, right. and so it just is it's funny to me or not funny but it's just very interesting to me that we all seek to see something that's like 
we don't know, you know, and possibly fear it when we right. just know squids are right there. Well, AR, as you know, just, to do, just before okay, we sat yeah, down, yes, 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 as you know, yes, yes. I'm working on this paper on garden snails. Okay, right? perfect. Garden this snails are consciousness, and garden snails, right, you think they're these totally mundane things, like everybody who lives in a temperate climate basically has messed around with these things. Yeah, they've seen them. Kids, yeah. and they're like the ultimate mundane animal. But they are so weird. They so are <laughs> so weird. So <laughs> their brains are, they only got like 60,000 central ner nervous system neurons. These are mostly in these little clumps um, that are kind of semi-connected with each other, mostly in a ring around their esophagus, right? So they got these little clumps, right? And they've got these really complex mating dances. And they've got way more neurons in their posterior tentacles mm. than they do in their central nervous system. Okay, so, yeah, okay, I guess you're just saying. Um, and the more you think about them, and the more, or the more I think about them, and the more I look at them, the weirder they seem. Well, should I tell you about garden snail yeah, mating dances? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like, yeah. Let's talk about let it ride. Let it ride. Can we talk yeah. about garden snail yeah. mating. I'll just like just to give you a flavor of this, right? So this is happening in your own backyard. Right, right, right. Right. So garden snails, they're simultaneous hermaphrodites. Okay. Right. That means they have both a penis and a vagina. Uh huh. So um, the way garden snail mating works is like this, right? So two. It takes about seven hours. Okay. Right. Wow. So two snails will notice each other, mm -hmm. and they'll come and they'll kind of reach, they'll, they'll touch each other, touch each other's kind of what you might think of as the face yeah, and yeah. the tentacles to each other, the kind of kiss, uh -huh. and they pull apart. And then they, they'll loop around and kind of go in a circle and taste each other's slime trails. Okay. It's like and then they'll come yeah. back together. And sometimes they'll bite each other a little bit and withdraw. <laughs> and then they'll go and circle around each other again. Right. And then they'll come, they'll come back together and kiss some more. And as they get aroused, their genitals are kind of on the right side of their neck, basically. Okay. And this thing that you know, I mean, if you pick up a snail, it will like, where are the genitals? Yeah, yeah. They're like, yeah. You know, they're like, they're in this bag on the right side of their neck, right? And when they get sexually aroused, this like white bag comes <laughs> out of the side of their neck that's got okay. both a penis and a vagina on Okay. It, right? So then they get kind of aroused like this, and then they shoot love darts at each other. Okay. So a love dart is like this centimeter long piece of calcium shaped like a dart covered in mucus. So they get sexually aroused and one will shoot a love dart at the other, only hit about a third of the time. Okay. Uh, the love dart will just like stick anywhere in the recipient snail, right? Usually doing a little bit of damage, uh -huh. right? And then the other one will reciprocate with its own love dart, which may or may not hit. And then uh, they try to get, it takes a lot of attempts, <laughs> they try to get uh, mating culminates when their penises go into each other simultaneously. Uh -huh. uh, this can take, this as I said, takes hours, hours. For this whole process to happen, right? Then they each send each other a spermatophore, like the sack of sperm and nutrients. Okay. The recipient then digests more than 99% of the sperm in the, in the spermatophore. And then they typically go off and mate with some other snails, right? So they mate multiple times. Uh -huh. And then they go and they find some soft spot of soil and they dig a little hole in the soil with their heads. Then they ovulate down into that hole. The eggs will come out. Uh -huh. That'll take also a couple hours. And the eggs of the snail whose, whose love dart landed are more likely to fertilize the eggs that come, that come out during ovulation. Because oh, okay. the the it looks like the um, the mucus on the love dart helps protect the sperm from being as much digested, right? So they digest over ninety nine percent of the sperm that they receive, but if their partner landed a love dart, right, right, then they will digest a, a you know they'll still digest ninety nine percent of the sure, sperm, sure. but it won't be quite as close to one hundred, right, right, um, and then they cover up the the eggs with the soil and, and go on their way. Fascinating. So this is like this super complex mating behavior, right? Right. That these entities do, these snails do, with only sixty thousand neurons in their central nervous system, right? Right. In rings around their esophagus and in little kind of bulbs in their, you know, in their heads, and um, gosh, it, and it's just so fascinating That's, to me yeah. to think like, wow, these are weird creatures. And if you take like I was talking about how you apply the standard theories of consciousness to the United States, and yeah. it looks like the United States is conscious. You apply the standard theories of consciousness to garden snails, and you get totally divergent answers, right? right? Like, right. according to some theories of consciousness, 
They have lots of conscious experiences. According to other theories of consciousness, they are as vo devoid of consciousness as a rock. Right. Right. They're just like complicated plants. And I've talked to experts on snails. Right. I've like, but yeah, I yeah, email yeah, like yeah, world yeah, sure. experts on snails that are like, hey, can we talk? Can I interview? Best friends. Now. I say, I say, hey, can I interview you? Yeah, right. yeah, sure, like, sure, okay, sure. This is my excuse to talk with them. And they have like totally divergent opinions. You know, one of them is like. No, snails aren't conscious. There's just these intricate machines. So fascinating. I dissect them all the time. Right. Or another one's like, oh, they're full of beautiful consciousness of the world around them. I just am more and more impressed at how, wow. how sensitive they are. So the theories of consciousness are totally divergent about them. The people, the biologists who interact with them all the time, totally divergent opinions about them. They're totally much weirder and more complicated than you ever would have thought. Mm -hmm. Their brain, I like their brains, right? Their brains, I mentioned some things about their brains, but here's another thing, right? You normally think about a neuron. A neuron has typically an axon yes. on one side and dendrites on dendrites, another. So it gets yeah. like a bunch of inputs through the dendrites and then it either fires or doesn't fire mm -hmm. an action potential down the axon. Well, in the central nervous system of, of the snail, there's not a clear dif differenti differentiation between axons and dendrites. Oh, wow. Plus their neurons are like huge by vertebrate standards. So the largest neurons in the world are um, in a, a, not exactly a snail, but a close relative of them called a sea hare, kind of like a, a big slug that lives uh -huh. in the sea. They get these giant neurons. Right. Right. So, they've, so even at a neural level, there are like some similarities and some differences. And like how much do those similarities and differences matter? It depends upon your theory. So, so uh, you know, the more I think about it, I just like garden snails are... They're this, 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 this thing that seems so mundane and so simple and so plain and, and boring. And once you kind of like look into it, it just this myriad of confusion, <laughs> confusing, fascinating things come out of it. And I think that's some of the best things that make us humans though, is that like we appreciate that kind of novelty. Yeah. And that, that like, even though that we can see differences, it's like we see a lot of our, the same, not, I guess, same tendencies, but it's like we can see that again. Hey, hey, we see it. Um, we yeah. see it in, what is it, like dolphins yeah. are, are, you know, very conscious comparatively, elephants, dogs, cats. Yeah. But then, I mean, you can take that for, like you said, go down all the way to sea slu or slugs, you know, a yeah. garden snail, et cetera. Yeah. So, but all, all, so this all came. So, what you were just mentioning was one of your posts uh, outcoming. So, you also run a run a blog called Splintered Minds. Yeah. Uh, started in two thousand six. Um, so, let's talk about that because obviously we'll finish up with that. Is writing has been a big part. You said that that's one of the first things you wanted to do, and then it, since you've kept this up basically for fourteen years, let's talk about how that kind of started. How it has changed. Um, maybe the the funnest uh, <laughs> blog post because then again like yeah. uh, we'll talk about your book that is a collection of, of that as well yeah. but yeah how, how did that all start like how did why why did you decide yep we're writing now and this is a, <laughs> oh yeah we're, we're sending out these ideas to the to the world if you will yeah um, so you know 2006 was probably the peak of when people were starting blogs oh sure sure yeah, you yeah. Know. <laughs> it was <Peak> before <laughs> yeah, it was before Facebook really started I think eventually Facebook and Twitter captured a lot of the energy sure. that had been going into blogs, but before Facebook and Twitter became popular, a lot of the stuff that we now think of as happening on those media was happening in blogs. So a lot of people were starting blogs around that time, and you know most of the blogs didn't survive, um, or haven't survived till now because yeah. you know people move on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I'm, I seem to be perseverating. Um, the a media occasion was that a science writer, Jay Ingram, had, he'd interviewed me for some stuff and talked about some of my work. And he had said somewhere, I think on his own blog, that he liked to dip into my work for weird, interesting ideas. Oh, okay, very cool. Right, and I thought, well, you know, I could just post like some ideas of, from my work on my blog. And then, you know, if he wanted to access them or any other science writer wanted to access them, they'd be out there. So that's how I started, just kind of like, let me take some of the ideas that are already in my papers sure. and just kind of like <laughs> drop them on the blog and just see if people are interested. And then, you know, I had wonderful conversations with the uh, readers of the blog who wrote mm -hmm. interesting comments. Sure. And, uh, over the years, I came to think of blogging as a kind of discipline. I don't just, now, instead of like putting things from my papers onto the blog, I create my papers out of my blog posts. Oh, so the, sure. The causal direction is now different. 
But I think of blogging as a kind of intellectual discipline. Sure. And as a philosopher, I feel like if I cannot take my idea and express it in 900, 1,000 words in a way that is clear to people who aren't specialists sure. uh, and shows what's interesting about it, then probably I'm lost in the weeds somewhere. Well, that goes back to your moral psychology and stuff of like, what is the point of philosophy? If it's all this abstract thing that is so far gone from people's interests or something, then what's the point? But if you give them a nice argument in a thousand words or something that they can yeah. distill and kind of chew on, if you will, I, th I think a lot more people would be philosophically inclined, <laughs> you know? I think everybody is a philosopher. They just don't like academic philosophy. There, right? there you go. Very I mean, good. everybody cares about what's the meaning of life, what yeah. should I be doing, yeah, what's yeah, ethical, yeah. The you know, what's the nature of, of the universe. Yeah. Everybody's a f everyone cares about that yeah, stuff. Sure. They just don't like the way that professional philosophers do it. I mean, yeah. some people love the way professional Right, right, right. But most of them don't, you know, and I don't think it has to be that way. And in fact, I think professional philosophers do, them a d do themselves a disservice because what happens when you write for a really limited audience is that you only get feedback from a really limited audience, mm. right? So you end up, potentially, you risk at least, kind of really provincial view. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you take your ideas and you make them plain and you put them out for everybody, then you get feedback from all kinds of quarters that you wouldn't necessarily get. That's so true, yeah. And it, especially with like what I was talking about with concealance of knowledge, one of the biggest things with philosophy, I guess you could say blind spots, it's maybe it's non, um, diversity of thought really you know yeah. like really getting like not saying the 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 mailman has his philosophy but he sort of does you know he does. He, like he and totally everyone does. else does the, cl <laughs> the store clerk does you know and, and yeah, et cetera right. so you know putting all those things together then we can kind of come up with some type of unity of knowledge and consilience but at the same time like I really like that you know you're playing you know you're tr like you said before you're trying to deal with things that you may not even believe in you know, and you're, you're trying to parse out some of this. So what is kind of, how has it changed over the years though? Because 14 years, I mean, yeah. that's a long, you said it's a, it's a discipline. So what is like kind of your writing process? Is it a process? Like, yeah. it, um, do you have goals for, for it? Or do you just kind of like, these are my musings. I'm kind of doing this as a service because I am kind of uniquely qualified. And then this is kind of information out there for the public or. Um, I do it because I love writing. Mm -hmm. I don't think of it as a service for the public. Although when I come well, up, that's good. For you get it, get it, when yeah, I come yeah. up for consideration <laughs> for promotion and stuff like that, I say, "Here's Awards. this important public service yeah. I do." <laughs> <laughs> right? But like for me, it's not. It's not so much a service for the public as much as I love writing, and it's a wonderful thing to be able to write something that I like that's about a thousand words long and share it immediately. Yeah, and yeah, I don't yeah. have to. There's no filter. I don't have to submit it to a journal sure. and get it approved. It doesn't have to go through some long publication process. I can write something I'm happy with and then share it. Yeah. So I do it for that reason because I like that and I like, I like having to do that every week and I like the feedback that I get um, about it from people and it's a great way for me to make, when, when you don't write or when I don't write, my ideas stay fuzzy and when I, but when I have to write them out, especially when I have to write them out in a way that makes them clear mm -hmm. and shows why they're interesting, right? That's when my ideas get concrete. So it helps me think. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that, that's helped with me in my blog posts of like being interested in a su subject and then yeah. actually having to go through the process of learning it or actually understanding it. Yeah. It helps so much more. But you said that um, in, in terms of like it, it almost seems like that's a very big creative outlet for you uh, in terms that's probably different than traditional academia and teaching, et cetera. So your most recent book, uh, a, um, okay, I, I just messed up with a theorem of jerks. A theory it, of jerks. A theory of jerks, okay. Most re I, I, my bad handwriting is here. Yeah. So most recent book, uh, a theory of jerks and other philosophical misadventures. Yeah. So, um, and this is all a collection of some of the, what was it, the top 100 or maybe the most interesting, yeah, et cetera? Yeah, like, some how did that favorite side shows, okay. right? So I've written over a thousand blog posts since 2006. So I chose 68, Okay. Yeah. I think. Something anyway, some number in that zone um, of my favorites. And then, and then, so the f first question is, what is a jerk? <laughs> <laughs> you know. A jerk is someone who culpably, and that's an important adverb. Culpably, culpably, 
fails to appreciate the intellectual and emotional perspectives of the people around him. Mm -hmm. and Very interesting. I use the male gender kind of consciously for that. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, uh, we were just talking about kind of the um, creative pro or the creative process turning into a publication process, turning into a marketing process, and actually uh, one of your essays deals with like zombie robots, but then yeah, that yeah, what yeah, yeah. that became not in the title, but then it still is something that's in the book. So yeah, maybe right. talk about zombie robots for a second. Right. You know? So the original <laughs> title, the title that I wanted the book to be was Jerks, Zombie Robots, and Other Philosophical Misadventures. Great title. I'm but with you. I'm with you. <laughs> MIT Press thought a theory of jerks <laughs> and other philosophical misadventures was a better title. Yeah. So. So that's what it ended up being. But um, yeah, so the, the zombie robots uh, piece, hmm, I'm wondering how much depth to get in on yeah, this. Yeah, no, so I, that is a very deep, actually, I, as soon as I said that, I was like, that is actually a lot of context. I'll just, yeah, I'll just say two things about it. Yeah, One sure. is that it's partly a reaction to Susan Snyder's really amazing book, which I don't know if you've read, mm -hmm. called um, Artificial You. Mm -mm. Just came out last fall. Okay, uh, she's wonderful. You might you might like to interview her. Yeah. <laughs> um, nice. So uh, it's partly a reaction to her work, um, but the idea, the zombie robot idea, connects with the stuff on consciousness, right? Sure. So in the philosophical jargon, a zombie is an entity who looks outwardly like an entity that has conscious experiences, but really there's no consciousness going on. Right. Right, so it's not like a Hollywood uh, zombie, yeah, no. right? It's a different kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's so like an apparition, or like a, it's like a, it's like a, what do they call it? Um, like a, uh, I'm trying to think of like a projection almost of something, right? Like, cause it's mm -hmm. not them, it's it's like, it's an appearance of them. It's like a facade almost. Yeah, cause there's not like there's, a facade. Yeah, yeah. facade is <laughs> right. so the idea is, well there are various, Mm -hmm. levels of strictness with which you could define what a zombie is, right? But kind of the rough idea is that you have an entity that might look outwardly like a person. Right. Um, but there's no conscious experience. So when it says, it might say, I'm having conscious experience. Right. But like Searle's Chinese Room or whatever, there's, noth there's mm -hmm. nothing going on. Right. So, so then this question is, if we built a robot, could we be able to tell whether it's a zombie robot, right? That, you know, outwardly it says, I'm having conscious experiences just like you, right? right? right. But inwardly, maybe, maybe Searle's not. right. Maybe it's just empty programming, right? right? Or maybe Searle's wrong and maybe there really are experiences. And how do we tell? How do we develop a science of this? How do we develop a philosophy of this? And we, I don't think we have very good tools for answering that question. Right. And I think that's actually going to become, I know we've got to wrap up, but I want to, this is the other talk. No, no, no. This is the other talk. We got time. We got time. <laughs> Let I think it's going to become an important. It's going to become an important practical issue, because there already is a robot rights movement. Mm, it's yes, small. Sir. yeah. It's very small, but small. I've I've even seen it. Yeah, 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 for sure. But but here's what's going to happen. I don't know whether it's going to be ten years from now or thirty years from now, but eventually there will be robots that a substantial minority of people think. These robots are conscious, just like us, and they deserve serious rights, just like we do. Mm -hmm. A minority of people will say that. Mm -hmm. And they might be right, and they might be wrong, mm -hmm. but whether they're right or wrong, it's going to be a big issue because we're going to have to now decide. Like, okay, some people think that these entities deserve rights. Are they right? We, well, right. let's, let's right. figure out, <laughs> are these entities, we do not have right now, and I don't see for the near future really a great way to answer these questions. So we're going to be stuck with, I think, I worry at least, that we'll be stuck with these entities that we create, that, we, that might either be kind of just all blank inside, no experiences, or alternatively, might be kind of conscious like us. Right. And we will not have a good scientifically based theoretical consensus about what to do with them. Yeah, there's no apparatus to start. Like, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, now, and now, let's say you've got a fire. Okay. Six of these robots in one room, five humans in another room. Are we in the trolley problem again? <laughs> <laughs> we're, in the, we're in the fire you can problem? Say, oh, yeah, yeah, you can make it a runaway trolley yeah, if yeah, you yeah, want, yeah. right? Yeah, Who yeah. do you save? Yeah. Right? You know, you might say, okay, well, if we don't know whether they're conscious, let's give them equal rights just to be safe. Right? But if they're not really conscious and you save the six robots, 
and let the five humans die in the fire. But still, to the to the to the universe or whatever, that still isn't right. You've lost. Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 you've lost five entities yeah. who really we know for sure yeah, those for humans sure. are conscious, right? Have been sacrificed to save six entities that, like theoretically, maybe they're conscious or maybe they're not. Right. Right. So, right. So I think these questions about about consciousness that I think are super hard to solve are going to at some point become a matter of practically relevant policy and we're not going to be in a good position to think about the ethics of that. Right. So when we think about the ethics of AI, a lot of people have thought, like Bostrom thinks, you know, about the risk to us. Right? And I think that's a totally serious, interesting issue. Mm -hmm. But there's also the risk that we will create entities that, and science fiction has been way better than full, full academic philosophers on this, right. the risk that we will create entities that will actually deserve rights that we do not give the rights they deserve and we enslave and kill them. Well, that, m my first example when you brought that up was in Tron. In, <laughs> in the, the species that kind of emerged, I can't remember what they were called, but like they basically emerged out of the programming and then they were thought of as like a threat or something to the users and then just killed, you know, or something. And so it's yeah. like exterminated, you know. But that's a very interesting, yeah, like you said, like very interesting questions that are right over, are already here. You know, they're not, they're not some weird future off thing. Like we're, we're dealing with that now. Like you, even though it's a very small um, robot rights movement, I've definitely seen that. You know, yeah. that's definitely something that's coming up. Um, so I guess we can kind of uh, parlay that into like, what are kind of, so on that, is, is, do you think that's really the kind of the coolest developments in philosophy right now? Or is it like different experimental philosophy? Like what are some of the cool, coolest things that are kind of pushing the boundaries? Is that the science fiction? Is that kind of what we've been talking about? Or is there something else that kind of have... Oh, there's lots of cool things. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but I think in general, um, what's happened over the last 20 years has been the reconnection of philosophy and psychology. Oh, okay. Right, yeah. so philosophy and psychology were intimately related and not even conceived of really as separate disciplines until the late 19th century, early 20th century. And then they separated. Do you think that's what, briefly, is that very like Freudian and all that psychoanalytical stuff? Is that, because that was around the same time? Yeah, or? I don't think it's as much Freud okay. because that was not as much in academia. Sure, or um, Jung or something. As, as the experimental philosophy. Sure. You know, people like, like Helmholtz um, early on and then later experimental psychologists. Got it. Um, dividing away from non-experimental uh, philosophers. Uh, and the discipline stayed very separate for uh, basically the whole 20th century. And then recently, I think, there's been this tendency in all areas of philosophy, whether it's ethics, whether it's philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, aesthetics, to some extent metaphysics, right, to reconnect with psychology and see the relevance of psychology and empirical work for philosophy and not think of philosophy as this completely a priori thing that you do in your armchair mm. without having to consult. Like we start with the brain at first, like we have to take into the brain. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's You kind do of, it with your brain. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. your brain is definitely involved. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, the more we know about the brain, the more we know about at least the process by which we're reaching our philosophical conclusions. So that has to be relevant to philosophy. So I found it really exciting over the last couple of decades how all of basically all of philosophy is reconnecting with empirical stuff and especially with empirical psychology. That's great because I think it, you're, it almost hints into as well the developments around us in like the state and of the universe, or not the universe, but like Earth, is that, you know, in chaotic times, at least I've read in p previous times, in chaotic times, like people look for the, that truth, that knowledge, that they have that yearning, you know, for some of this. And maybe that's kind of one of the connections of the last 20 years is that people you know, really have been yearning for this type of information, I think. I mean, or at least I, I mean, people like me I, who are naturally curious, I think, yeah. are yearning for that kind of stuff. Um, so do, we already kind of talked about philosophers, like, and having a certain value um, to the society that they're a part of, and then maybe philosophy in general. But um, we're here in the U UC Riverside Philosophy Library uh, with some of, you know, names such as Kant, Hegel, Locke, Hume, you know, et cetera. But um, who is, who's someone that like maybe a regular person, like a layman that like, that maybe they may not know, you know what I mean, a, a, a philosopher and, and they might be interested in that. I mean, more as someone that, you know, 
just interested in say, hey, hey, what's an esoteric philosopher? Is it the Chinese philosophers that you mentioned, or is there another mo name that kind of comes to mind, like a Wick Wittgenstein or something like that? Ah, like a philosopher I re might recommend. Yeah, yeah, like uh, like for a normal person that's just you know, say they work yeah. a regular job. Like how how would how would they get in and be interested? You know, is it a Sartre? Or, you know, or is it Camus writing, or is it you know that kind of yeah. stuff? Well, I've always loved philosophers who are great writers. Um, so Zhuangzi is wonderfully fun if you like that kind of thing. I mean, people might know the most famous part of the Zhuangzi is his uh, butterfly dream. Okay. People, have, you might your, your viewers might have seen heard this story before. Zhuangzi dreamt that he was a butterfly. Okay. Floating around, doing whatever he liked, you not thinking about much, right? And then he wakes up, and there he is, you know, a human. <laughs> and then he thinks, wait. Am I a human who just dreamt he was a butterfly, or am I a butterfly now dreaming that I'm a human? It's <laughs> <That's> great, <laughs> right? So that's like, wow, that's weird and cool, right? In this ancient Chinese philosopher, right? So, so he's wonderful and weird, right? Um, another philosopher, I think, that is a wonderful writer sometimes that that readers might be able to connect with is John Stuart Mill. Okay, like On Liberty. Okay, is sure. a really wonderful essay. Um, about the value of, of liberty and freedom of thought and that sort of mm -hmm, thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's not it's not weird in the same way that right, 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 is, right, right. But right. it's 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 a really wonderful it's a really wonderful piece. I think. I also really love um, Montaigne. Okay. He's this. Uh, I wrote. Early, I read on solitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. He's day, this yeah. early French philosopher. That was hard. That was that was very technical. That was weird. Like you had to start a little bit because I mean it's so old. It's like what 1500s, I think. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah so it's old, um, but he's he's so personal. Oh, totally. Yeah, he's yeah. he's got the he's really he kind of partly invented the personal essay, mm -hmm. right? Where he's just kind of like, well, here are my oh, thoughts about yeah, things, sure. and he kind of rambles off in different directions, mm -hmm. and you know he's always interesting. That's so good. Um, okay, so then I, I'm gonna put this as a as a segue in that how has teaching and being a professional, I guess you could say, professional philosopher, if you were academic philosopher, changed your life? Because I understand, you know, obviously we talked about before about the ethics and moral psychology and stuff. Is like, do you think you personally are more like inclined philosophically? It's like, what are your thoughts now? Mm. You know, being in being in the biz, if you will, for the <laughs> last thirty years, and mm. then obviously that's different than when you came, young buck, you know, into Searles post postgraduate, you know, kind of grad yeah. grad student. So, like, tell, what, how have you changed personally in this? Wow, that's interesting. I don't. I mean, I don't know. Because I've kind of been an academic nerd my whole life, so you know, if I hadn't gone into philosophy, what, who what, what are I, you? What yeah, would yeah. I have been? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, my I've always been a writer, and I've always been kind of undisciplined in thinking about big picture issues about things. So I think, oh, look, if I'd gone into finance or something like that, I. Be hyper attuned to that. <laughs> Probably be like <laughs> super philosophical. Anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, I that's don't know. Um, one. So I don't have a very good answer to your question. Well, I mean, maybe then how how has your teaching style changed? Or like, because you also said you yes. had a wife and two kids. Like, yeah. well, your personal life outside of work obviously is dic not dictated, but maybe right. influenced by you know your career that you chose. <laughs> I, t I will tell you one one way in which my teaching style has changed. And it's connected a little bit with what I was saying about the blog too. Uh -huh. So at the lower division level, you know, these at UCR we have these giant classes of hundreds of students. At the lower division level, I had for a few years taught Introduction to Philosophy, mm -hmm. and I taught some issues I thought were really interesting, like you know, how is the mind related to the body, and does God exist, and what is it to be a person? I mm -hmm. think I focused on those three specific issues, and then the students are like, beyond. <laughs> Yeah, I thought the, stu the issues are really interesting, but it was not connecting with the students. And I kind of respect that yawning, right? Like if they're yawning, if they're bored, then they're not learning, and it's kind of your fault right. as the teacher. You have to have some onus of that problem. Yeah. Everybody's interested in philosophy. Yeah. So if they're not interested in your philosophy, then 
you're doing something wrong as a teacher, I think. I mean, that's a little harshly put, but... <laughs> no, to get the argument but, across. Know, yeah, can, yeah, like, yeah, we, we're here. Nuance, yeah, add some yeah. nuance to that. So, um, so I totally redesigned the class, uh, and I now call it evil. Mm, okay. And we start with lynching photography. Okay. So, and I usually teach this in the fall term to the, like, the brand, brand new students right out of high school, right? And that very first reading is like, all right, and the thing about the, I focus mostly on photographs where the white people who are perpetrating these racially motivated lynchings in the United States and the South in the early 20th century mostly. Oh, that's, I mean, the most famous photo is the two men hanging from, you know, a rope in, I think, Mississippi or something. And then yeah, yeah. you just see like a hundred eyes looking at the photographer. And you're, yes, that's right. A, exactly. That's a very... There's a lot yeah. of photos like that. So yeah. I, that's one of the photos I use and lots of others sure. like that. Right, and then the question is like, and a lot of times these people who are being killed, it's like they didn't do anything. Even the white people who killed them are like, well, you know, she lied to a police officer. Something like that, yeah, something ridiculous. <laughs> you know, yeah, like yeah. not a capital crime. Yeah. Her son did something. So, and these people are proud. They are smiling for the camera. Yeah. There is a, like, you can read the descriptions of the torture. There is a totally. mutilated corpse they've just tortured. Yeah. They are sometimes just a few feet away from, away from it. They bring their children. Chil literally kids are right there. Yeah, yep. yeah. I've seen that. Yep. And it's like, okay, what is going on in these people's minds? Right. That is the question of this class. Wow. Right? Wow. So I give them that. That's the question of the class. And the students are like, I mean, some students are bored still yeah, yeah. anyway. Well, right? I think but they're much more interested. Sometimes they're bored. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're much more interested. They're much more interested. And then, and then we get into, I just I talked about Mengzi and Shenzi, yeah. human nature, right? Like, so if, if Mengzi is right, there's some, all these people, if they stopped and they thought about it, they would, there's some part of them that would be like, this is horrible, how can I be doing this? Right. And they're just not thinking about it. They're not really reflecting. And if they reflected, they would know, like, we should not murder this woman because her son did something, right? Right, right, right. If Shuns is right, if Monks is right, that's, that's right, right? And if, Sh and Shuns is like, no way, look at these people. Right, obviously Shinzi's is not yeah, saying yeah, that, yeah, right? Yeah, but like yeah, a Shinzian perspective is like, no, look, morality is an artificial social construction. If you're in a social environment that says this is morally okay, that's what you're going to think. Yeah. Right? You don't have this internal resource that's going to tell you something else. Right. right? These people are smiling. This is, you know, you, they don't have these hearts that Mengzi thinks they have. Right. Right. right? And then the, the class becomes this question about, okay, is Mengzi right? Is Shinza right? Is there some other alternative view that's right? Let's look at the history of the Holocaust. Let's look at moral psychology. Sure. Let's look at social psychology. Let's, let's look at primate behavior. Mm -hmm. Let's look at all these things and try to address this question and then the students care. Well, that's interesting because it's almost like, a, it's all, and now forgive me of anything, but and I, obviously I don't want to armchair teach your class, but it seems yeah. like at first maybe it was a top-down approach of like, you, I'm gonna give you these things and you're supposed to be enthralled by s philosophy at the end of this. Yes. Rather than like, take the most enthralling philosophical argument, throw it right in the beginning, and then we talk about from exactly. a bottom-up approach, how do we get there? How do we figure out That's how right. to deal with that? Exactly, exactly. Because yeah. everybody, I think everybody is interested in philosophy, right? So the way to teach it is you meet them where they're interested. Right, 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 right. And then you show how it connects back into the into these issues that they might not have realized that they would be interested in. That's great. That's yeah. great. And so um, we talked briefly before about the influences when you were growing up, um, being a lot of writers, et cetera, maybe some science fiction in, in there. But how has that changed? How has your influences changed over time of like who, obviously you have to do your work and your discipline and your academia, but like how has and this can go out into life, if you will, but how have your influences into life, have, what shapes your worldview, what then shapes your phil philosophical view, changed over the years? Because I'm assuming, like for me, when I was growing up, it was, you know, very different than what it is now, just by mm. the sheer facts of, like you said, your social construct, um, but then also how I was raised, you know, uh, it, uh, we're all each our own person, but how have you changed, not just philosophically, but with your influences? My influences are really not very consistent over time. That, well, that's a good, okay. So I think I said in, at one point that I'm undisciplined in a certain yeah, kind of yeah, way yeah. and it's self-conscious. I, I trust my sense of fun. Mm, so and you I really look for that. Okay. I encourage people to trust their sense of fun. So I think, you know, if you find something fun and interesting, like go chase it down and like figure out because there's something in you that's like, 
I don't think we find things fun intellectually mm. unless we're learning something. We might not know why it is we find it fun or what we're learning, but there's something in us that's like, wow, this is so cool. This is so interesting. Right. So I, I trust that in myself. Right. And so, and it's always something different. It could be like, Snails. <laughs> is that, right, but is that so? Be, is that so benign as like your childlike curiosity still being around now, though? Yes. Because right. I know a lot of people though that may not. I mean, they may intuitively think that deep down, but they're not showing that. They're not actively trying to be curious, right. you know. And but but at the same time, like, it, whenever I feel the need to be curious, and then you go munch on that thing, yeah, yeah, there's yeah, yeah. so much fulfilling, and you just don't know where it's gonna go. Exactly. Yeah, that's the big thing. Exactly. And one of the wonderful things about philosophy is. Always comes around, right? Because <laughs> right? comes everything around. is connected, <laughs> right? And because like my mind is gonna bring it around somehow sure, or other, sure. right? regardless. We'll connect right? these dots. But yeah. yeah, it's like there's nothing more deadening as an academic than to think, "This is what I do. This is what I have to do. This is what I have to read. This is what I'm gonna do. This is what I have to do. I'm gonna do it again." Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And like, oh, it's so boring and so tiring. So it's like. Whoa, snail sex is so weird. Right. <laughs> like, how do they do that? Snail brains are totally weird, right? That's Let great. me go like learn everything I can about that, and you know, bug snail researchers. Yeah, and parse and out a philosophical out. argument out of this. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Or like science fiction. Whoa, this science yeah. fiction is so interesting, right? Let me go read it and learn more about it, right? And whenever I do that, I end up in a place that I like eventually. Okay. So, um, so it's not so much like a consistent influence. That's it's really though. more of a kind of letting myself be taken and and as you, I liked your metaphor of chewing on the yeah oh, chewing like, on yeah. the thing yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. feeds your curiosity and one of my advisors was Alison Gopnik right and she I don't know if you know her work at all mm -mm. Um, oh she'd be another great okay. person to think about interviewing Alison Gopnik let's go <laughs> she's a developmental psychologist okay uh, and she loves the way children think. Uh -huh. And she thinks that scientists are basically kind of big children. Oh, well. She thinks yeah. that what happens in childhood is that you're kind of, she describes childhood as uh, research and development. Uh huh. And adulthood as sales and marketing. <laughs> okay, makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally, totally. Yeah, right? sales and marketing. Yeah, very good point. You're trying to sell something and you're trying to look the best, market yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And like, yeah, you know, yeah. the children. <laughs> all right, their minds are open to all kinds of things. They're learning oh, they're all sponges. kinds of things. Yeah. I love four-year-olds in particular. I know Allison does too, yeah. right? They're so weird. Their, their way of thinking about the world, they're four-year-olds, they're sophisticated enough linguistically to say things that are removed from the immediate moment, mm. but their minds are so different from ours. Right. You know, speaking about different minds. And they say the strangest things. Yeah. So I, wa I love four-year-olds. And, right, so... The scientist, and I think also the creative philosopher, in Allison's view, Allison Gopnik's view, is someone who keeps their childlike mind, their childlike flexibility and curiosity and kind of lack of discipline to some extent, right? Uh, instead of, and is learning and shaping uh, new ways of thinking all the time out of a kind of childlike curiosity. That's amazing. But my only question is, when would we not want that? You know what I mean? Like, why is why is that not the key to? You know what I mean? Like, when would we not want that? Well, I just don't. You know what I mean? If your whole company is oh yeah, is right, research right. And <laughs> development somewhat facetious, but yeah, you know. What I mean? But but at the same time, it's like, wouldn't you always want like more diverse knowledge and thought, but and be able to chew things? But at the same time, like yeah, if you're you're straight straight razored edge on something, then that's I guess okay in that discipline. I think there are a lot of short and medium-term benefits as an academic. I see. To going for, this is the thing I'm expert on, I'm gonna add this twist to it, or do Good it point. again. Mm -hmm. This is the thing that's hot in the field right now, so I should contribute to this discipline. This is the thing that will advance my career. This is like, science fiction is not even respectable philosophy right, right. or whatever, right? There's a, lot of, there's a lot of pressures in the short and medium term to be more on that. More on the marketing and sales sure, side, right? Absolutely. Um, but I do think long term, being more childlike and trusting your sense of fun is win win, right? It's both more enjoyable as an academic process and if you can survive the short term hits. Yeah. And, ten <laughs> and tenure helps. Tenure helps, other things help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you can survive the short term hits, 
but then in the long term, you've got a kind of engagement and fun in your, I mean, if you find your work boring, other people are gonna find your work boring oh, too, Oh, surely. Right? Well, that's what I was thinking about with writing. It was like, that was the biggest things that I thought was that like, if I'm not willing to read my own stuff, why would anyone else, you know what yeah, I mean? And then right. it's like, you try and put some literary devices or metaphors and analogy to make it fun, but then it becomes then fun to then figure out what is fun. You know, yeah, like right. that, you know, that whole deal. Um, yeah. So then let's, let's, let's have a little fun as a last question. Okay. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we won't keep it as like a question, but we'll keep it almost like a, I guess, a thought experiment. And then what can we garner from this? So, um, and some people have actually done this physical experiment, but for us here on earth, we have to do it as a thought experiment. Okay. Is that right now there have been 500 or so astronauts that have gone into outer space and oh. they've seen the Earth from outer space. So there, I think 10 billion people since ho lower hominids, you know, in the last 200,000 years have existed. So humans, about 10 yeah. billion. Well, out of that, only 500 have seen the Earth from space. Yeah. And the reason why I think that this is such a big deal is that not just technologically, like, yes, I think we entered a new age in almost the 60s with like, you know, the it, it, going up into space and uh, the internet, et cetera, but more philosophically in that this was the first time when we saw, the earth saw itself, mm. you know, as that as you were talking about that right. super organism, if you will, yeah. well, in 1968, when we had the Apollo 8, you know, circum, or circumnavigate, or not circumnavigate, it orbited the earth and came around and saw the Earthrise photo, famous time photograph, you know, right. went around the, everything. Well, that was the first time that Earth then became aware of itself almost. Yeah, right. yeah. And so there's a lot of other things like, you know, the Earth sits in a void. It's like literally a death desert. And then we have this <laughs> oasis, yeah. the thinness of the atmosphere, you know, from that death desert to, you know, the yeah. oasis is such a thin membrane of, of protection. And then also mm -hmm. astronauts seeing that, you know, there's only geographic boundaries. Uh, there's no borders. You know, the, it, after World War II, there wasn't a bunch of white men just sitting in a boardroom that literally said in the Middle East, well, here, this line is this country. So what can we take from that, f an overview effect? I usually ask people yeah. like, what would you say if you were up there looking down or something? But like, what, what are some mm. implications from that? Like, is there any things, like am, am I so far gone to think that like you can garner anything from something like that? Yeah, well, it's, that's wonderful. I would, it would be interesting, maybe someone's done it. Yeah. To do a, some sort of systematic study of what the astronauts who experienced this said about their experience and how it affected them. Well, I'll give you a, a little anecdote. Is the, is the the, I guess you could say the moniker of like what other people talk about it is that it is quote a transcendence like experience. Yeah. And it's like, well, man, that's. But then at the end, you get to. This is why I bring this up: is the practical nature of getting every single person on Earth up to space to then see Earth. <laughs> And I don't it, know how And then it might not feasible. be transcendent it, it, You know, exactly. And then so my, my thing is that, well, like VR, virtual reality is yeah. coming on board and some of those kind of like, because yeah. we were talking a lot about, about mediums and messaging and like from a book to a content from a video. Well, what about if you were actually experiencing that? You know, what yeah. if you put on a haptic suit and, you know, put on virtual reality glasses, then all that sense material is getting better and better and closer and closer yeah. to reality. So I'm just trying to, you know, what, 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 what are some of the implications that, or what are some of the things that you think of when? Well, I'm thinking about, this may not be exactly the same thing, but mm -hmm. it's kind of in the neighborhood. I'm thinking about science fiction and weird philosophy, which you've talked about mm -hmm. a lot. Of course. Right. So one of the things that I really like about philosophy and science fiction, and the weirder the better for this, is it's knocking you out of your narrow kind of day-to-day -day provincial, this is how the world is, yep. right? So you read some weird ancient Chinese philosopher who has a very different view of things. And you're like, whoa, I guess you don't have to see the world the way I usually do, mm -hmm. right? There have been other yep. people who've seen it very differently, mm -hmm. right? Or if you think about various science fiction scenarios, right? Wow, an alien could have a totally different way of thinking or people in a different, you could have a totally different kind of utopian or dystopian society, right? And that, I think the philosophy and science fiction both have this potential to really broaden mm. your sense of 
the possibility of human experience right and the possibility of maybe non-human experience too right knock you out of that kind of you know home work family circle mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where you're doing all the mm -hmm. same things and you're talking with people who are basically like you all the time mm -hmm. and share your opinions and um, that kind of I like the weirdness and the wonder and the sense of perspective you can get from going as far as possible toward the strangest stuff in psychology and philosophy and speculative fiction right and that might be a little bit like what the astronaut yeah, yeah. See, I don't know, maybe not, but to some extent. Yeah, I mean, well, to some extent, I think, yeah, to some extent, I think you're, you have to have some type of awe, I think, of just being up there and going yeah, through a journey, so you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. at the same time, do you think it's, I don't, I, it probably wouldn't be the same just it going through that experience and then actually just watching it, you know? Again, yeah. there's levels of, of, of that. Right. Um, but for me, I just really think of the biggest thing that the reason why I bring up the overview effect at the end is is I really go back to like Richard Feynman and how he his dad really taught him to like think like a Martian because like think as you were just talking about think differently of the possibilities because if you were having to explain the world right now to a Martian like good luck man you know what I mean because it's <laughs> yeah, like yeah. it's very very specific very right. esoteric to our way of doing things and to a Martian it just wouldn't make sense or wouldn't or would make total sense and, and so just thinking about that possibility of like well we'll try and explain this but then even if you go more so past the even explaining is okay we're starting from scratch now new world it's right here what do we do what type of governance do we do what type of economic mm -hmm. system what type of all those type of things well then that only gets to the possibility like you said um, expand your purview, as I, I think you just said. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, last thing then, is there any other, like, I guess you could say impartial or parting knowledge that you'd like to tell our viewers or, or <laughs> to tell everyone to go buy your book? Or is there a, I mean, I know you said you have a lecture coming up, but uh, what, what are some things that people can, I, we'll put things on the show notes for people to find right. you, but what, what's uh, some last comments, I guess you could say? Right. Well, they might, people might like my book if they like the, yeah, yeah, yeah. what we've been talking about. A lot I think of that they kind will. Of stuff is in is in my most recent book, or they could go visit my blog, read some of my science fiction stories. I've uh, so yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think that's that. one of the things that I'm I'm gonna dive into now is your science fiction stuff. Yeah. So yeah. Well, cool. Well, I think that's uh, all the time we have for today. So uh, thanks for coming on Eclectic Spacewalk Conversations, Eric. And yeah. until next time, at Astra.